Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Fabio Roli, uh, and I'm one of the two co-tutorialists, uh, together with my colleague, uh, Battista Vigio, who is uh, just in front in the, the first row of the room. Uh, today, the tutorial that we are going to give uh, is about uh, adversarial pattern recognition. And uh, while uh, the, 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 the related field of adversarial learning, that, that of course is very related to, to, to pattern recognition in, in adversarial environment. Uh, so let me start uh, mentioning uh, uh, this paper that probably you have read or not, uh, but it's uh, not so important. Uh, it's a paper, uh, as you can see, about uh, recognition of uh, faces of celebrities, well, famous singers, famous actors, uh, well, uh, using a deep uh, neural network. Mm? So this is the task and the paper that has been published, uh, well, about two years ago on the British Machine Vision Conference, reported uh, some results about the recognition accuracy of a very uh, deep neural network uh, trained uh, to recognize uh, face images uh, of a good number of, of celebrities. You see the number 2,622 celebrities. And the authors reported, uh, well, quite a good accuracy. It's not the only paper dealing with uh, uh, recognition of uh, celebrities. Uh, that is a quite uh, popular topic. So th this is just one example of this kind of task. Uh, you can find on the web, of course, uh, uh, an archive, many other papers. Uh, uh, in a few slides now, of course, I, I, say, I, I say you why I'm mentioning this paper during the introduction. Uh, recognizing celebrities, uh, uh, as I told, uh, is, a, is a funny well, task, uh, sometimes it's a funny game, not only recognizing celebrities, but also impersonating celebrities. Mm? I imagine that uh, while in your countries there are some uh, TV shows uh, where people are challenged to, to recognize or to impersonate uh, celebrities. In Italy, for, ex for example, there is this uh, quite popular, very popular probably, show, TV show, the Italian name is tale quale, that means in, in English we can translate as, uh, well, just the same, exactly the same. And in this uh, Italian TV show, the challenge for participants uh, is uh, trying to impersonate uh, famous singers at the best. And, and the best impersonation, of course, is the winner. Why I'm mentioning these at the beginning of, of our tutorial? Because now I ask you a, a small mental experiment that, of course, is biased for what I, I want to, to tell you. And the mental experiment that uh, I ask you it is, is this one. Imagine that there is, uh, well, in a few years, a new TV show. There is a problem. Okay, it's again on. Uh, there is a new TV show called uh, The Deep Impersonator. Yeah, of course, it's an invention, it's an hypothetical TV show. And uh, in this hypothetical TV show, the challenge for the participant uh, is to challenge uh, well, the last release uh, of a deep neural network trained to recognize uh, celebrities. And uh, the challenge for the participant uh, is to evade the face recognition system, impersonating the celebrities. But to be more precise, uh, imagine that you are one of the participants of this TV show, and your challenge, uh, you are a man, a gentleman, 45 uh, years old, white, and uh, you want to impersonate, uh, the challenge is impersonating a famous actress, uh, well, probably you know or not, this actress is a very famous model, American model and actress, Milan Jovovich. Uh, so, well, now my question for you is, 
what kind of trick, uh, more technically, what kind of uh, face spoofing technique uh, you think that could be the best to, let's say, evade, to fool uh, these uh, face recognition system using, based on deep network, to, to win uh, the competition, to win this TV show? Wh which kind of trick? Uh, well, I hope it is clear enough because it's simple. What is the goal? Hmm? There is uh, in this hypothetical TV show called uh, the Deep Impersonator uh, a face recognition system using a deep network. Imagine very well trained, carefully designed, and you, as a participant of the show, should uh, fool, should evade the face recognition system in the sense that you are able to impersonate uh, this American actress model, Mila Jovovich, so that uh, for the face recognition system, you are recognized uh, as uh, Mila Jovovich, as this uh, nice lady. Okay, which kind of trick uh, you think that could be the best? Of course, so well, uh, well, you can imagine that if you use uh, a smart trick, uh, you have more chances to to be the winner of the competition. Any, any idea or any proposal for the trick that you could use? Makeups, that's very good. Yeah, that's very good. Yeah, makeups uh, is, is a very reasonable trick. Uh, and indeed, uh, uh, if you're a computer scientist, hmm, like probably whole people in this room, uh, maybe the first thing that you could imagine to do is uh, uh, look at the state of the art in face recognition, just to understand uh, which are the most promising tricks. And uh, if you do that, and uh, you look at the state of the art in face recognition, uh, very easily, using Google, you, you can find uh, in a few seconds uh, that uh, a few years ago, there was a, a quite large research project funded by Europe, funded by the European Commission, that was, uh, well, the name of the project was uh, Tabula Rasa, a project in Europe fully devoted uh, to investigate the security of biometric system, and in particular, face recognition system. And uh, at the end of the project, uh, there was a, a quite large competition where the participant of the competition should challenge uh, uh, many different uh, commercial and academic uh, uh, university face recognition system. Yeah, and uh, well, the participants, they proposed many different and, uh, well, funny and sometimes very smart tricks from very simple tricks like uh, uh, using plastic mask, you see the photo, yeah, to impersonate other guys, uh, or just very, let's say simple trick like using a printed sheet, a printed photo. But really, the winner of this competition and within this project, Tabula Rasa, was uh, a lady that, who used uh, makeup, hmm? who used makeup uh, to impersonate uh, the gentleman that uh, you see very close to this lady. So yes, uh, using makeup uh, is, uh, in many cases, a good trick. But now the, the second question is, uh, is really the best trick considering that uh, you remember the assumption, you are imagining that uh, uh, the face recognition system is based on deep network. Hmm? So considering this peculiar feature, we are speaking about a face recognition system based using deep network. Do you think that uh, well, you could exploit these more and uh, to find more, uh, let's say, subtle, more smart trick. Do you have any idea? In addition to makeup, that is anyway a good idea. Any other idea if you think that? Yes, please. Mm, that's good. <laughs> That's another possibility. That's another possibility. Any other idea? Any other trick? Using makeup, using Google to find uh, other images or 
Well, another interesting trick uh, has been, uh, has been uh, reported and proposed in a paper published uh, just last year. And this is, is this one. Uh, last year at a security conference, so not a conference uh, focused on computer vision of machine learning, but uh, at a conference, ACM conference on computer communication and security, uh, a few people uh, proposed an algorithm that uh, is able to provide as output, which should be the colors of a, a special, particular kind of high glasses that uh, if you wear these high glasses, uh, the face recognition system based on deep nets recognize you, and you, if you are a gentleman like in, in, the, in, in the picture, as Milan Jovovic. So you see, well, uh, it's enough, uh, or looks enough, uh, if you look at the result reported in this paper, that uh, to evade, to fool a face recognition system using a deep network, uh, you don't need any special makeup, uh, but it's enough this uh, particular kind of high glasses. Well, uh, and of course, uh, you cannot use any pair of eyeglasses, but uh, the particular patterns of color of that high glasses is the output of a special optimization algorithm that uh, is able to find the patterns of colors for the high glasses so that uh, that is enough uh, to evade, to change completely the recognition output of the deep network network. Why I'm telling you that? Because, well, one of the results that we hope with my colleague to provide you at the end of this tutorial is to explain you exactly which kind of algorithm is able to provide this result so that in the end you are really able to fabricate a real. Because, well, in this case, the, the eyeglasses that you see in the picture that the gentleman is wearing are, well, real high glasses. They fabricated these high glasses and they, using these high glasses, they showed and they reported the experiment that uh, uh, if this image is collected by a video camera and is provided to a deep face recognition system, the recognition result is uh, you are Mila Jovovich. That is it can appear quite impressive as a result. And at the end of this tutorial, we will give you the detail of the algorithm, not only this one, but all the other algorithms. So the first uh, message is, uh, well, I think that we all uh, are convinced, and it's true, that uh, we are living a very exciting time for, for better recognition and machine learning, because uh, there is a big interest, uh, from many stakeholders, from companies, uh, and uh, so our work, research works, uh, can uh, provide results for many real applications, for many technologies. But uh, just for this reason, there are new issues, especially new security issues, that we should consider when we design machine learning algorithms and pattern recognition application. So the question is, are we ready for this? Can we, we use uh, the classical, let's say the vanilla, the plain machine learning model when we address uh, adversarial pattern classification or pattern recognition task? To answer this question together with you, let me start uh, really from the fundamentals. And so le le let me consider this slide that is a clear picture of the classical uh, uh, pattern classification model, the statistical model. You see the main elements of the architecture. I, I, I'm sure that you know all the detail very well. You have a data source, uh, and then usually to uh, simplify the task, uh, you extract uh, a set of features, a set of attributes to characterize uh, the data that you want to recognize, uh, usually any modern 
better classification, pattern recognition system is equipped with learning capability mm, to model the data distribution uh, and so on and so far. But, uh, well, I suppose that you know very well all this stuff. So I want to focus your attention on, uh, well, you see, two assumptions that usually we do and we take for granted mm, when uh, we implement, we design pattern classification system. The first is that uh, we assume, and it's true for the most of cases, that the source of data is given. That means that it does not depend on the classifier, and it does not depend on the machine learning algorithm. Uh, usually it's the opposite. You design the pattern classifier so that you model hmm, the data source. Uh, of course, the data source can be non-stationary, but is given, is non-stationary, but it's given. And the second assumption, that, and I want to bring your attention on the second assumption that is usually common and it's true, is the noise affecting data is stochastic, is the reason why we use probabilistic modeling for machine learning and pattern recognition. So now the question is, uh, can this model, that is the traditional model, use it under attack? Under attack, I mean, when you have uh, an adversarial situation, when your problem, your classification recognition problem, have some uh, adversarial feature, some adversarial aspects. Uh, to answer this question, let me consider an example of a pattern classification task that has a clear adversarial angle. Okay, a clear adversarial uh, nature. And uh, the problem is spam filtering. I think that uh, it's quite clear to all of us that uh, spam filtering uh, has uh, an adversarial Okay, sorry, but sometimes I was to switch on and twist, to switch off and on the microphone. Uh, why? Consider this simple example of spam filtering. I assume that uh, for sure you know, unfortunately, what is spam and, and so the problem of spam filtering. Imagine that uh, your anti spam filter is a linear classifier. Why? Uh, but first, because uh, there are m many, many uh, modern and real products for anti-spam, uh, which are really re linear classifier. One famous uh, uh, anti-spam filter that is a, a linear classifier is Spam Assassin. So don't consider this example uh, a toy exercise or a, or a toy example, uh, because it's, uh, it's very simplified, of course, but it's quite clear to the reality, because indeed, uh, uh, in the reality, uh, anti-spam filters can be and are linear classifier, like in the case of spam assassin. And in this, in this example, I imagine that uh, my anti-spam filter uses like feature, like input feature, simply binary feature related to the words that you can find in the body of the email and which can be related to spam message or legal message. Well, I mean, for instance, you could imagine that uh, the two keywords, buy and Viagra, are two features that you use to characterize uh, spam emails because, because are related to a spam message, someone who wants to sell you this product, this product, and so is inviting you to buy a product. And so when you find in the body of the email the keyword buy and the keyword or Viagra, your binary feature related is equal to one or zero. So you are speaking on a binary feature, first thing. Second thing, in this example, we are considering that for each feature, for each keyword, in this case, like by Eva Yagra, there is a weight, a weight related to the importance of the feature. You see, for the feature, for the keyword by, the weight is equal to one, and for the other feature, Viagra, 
is equal to 5. So the, the operation of your linear classifier, of your anti-spam filter, is very simple. If the sp email is the email that you see, and the body of the email contains simply the text by Viagra, of course, in this ex simple example, you see that your linear classifier is able to recognize correctly the email, the message, as a spam message. If you consider this problem within a, an hypothetical feature space, the situation is very simple. Your anti-spam classifier is simply a linear discrimination function, a linear decision boundary, and everything is very clear, it's very simple. You can imagine that you learn the weights of this anti-spam filter of this uh, uh, linear classifier using many algorithm well know like the perceptor algorithm that by the way it's really the real case for the spam assassin anti-spam filter but now we should consider that uh, there is a clear adversarial nature for uh, uh, spam filtering it's not a, a, a traditional well a traditional is not a problem classification problem like optical character recognition because there is an adversarial nature. What does it mean that uh, there is an adversarial nature? That uh, uh, spam messages uh, are designed at the end of the day by human beings, the so-called spammers that want to sell you something or they want to do other, let's say, malicious things. And so, some, well, these guys, these, let's say, bad guys, the spammers who send you the spam messages, they invent a lot of tricks to evade uh, uh, anti-spam classifier. A very common trick, uh, very well known, it can be considered, let's say, a, a classical trick used by spammers, is adding good words to the email. Why? Because uh, usually, and it's very clear if you look at the slide, uh, there are some words, call it good words, which are not frequent in uh, spam message and which are very common in legal emails, uh, in good emails. And so the weights related to such feature are usually low or negative. So it's quite clear the click, or should be clear the trick, if the spammer adds this kind of good words to the email, oh, well, it's very likely that it's able to evade the anti-spam filter. And at the same time, uh, let's say that the message by Viagra is still understandable. Mm? And so this could appear a little bit strange, but this trick works very well, and in many cases, it's able to evade the anti-spam filter, and so to reach the goal of the spammers. If you consider this situation and this particular trick, call it adding good words, uh, from the feature space view, you can imagine something like this. You see, what does it mean adding good words when you look at a, an abstract feature space? Uh, it means that uh, the pattern representing the email, but it, you should consider that in this representation, each point inside this feature space is one email. When you add good words, this means that uh, you are adding information so that uh, the pattern representing the email is shifted to another region of the feature space where the pattern, and so the email, is misclassified as a legal email, as a genuine email, even if it's a spam, is a spam message. But the important thing to know for our discussion today is that it uh, should be quite evident, quite clear, that uh, adding good words uh, can be considered uh, a sort uh, of addition of noise, but the kind of noise is not stochastic. Hmm? If you look at the picture, you can, uh, after a while, realize that the noise that you add to the patterns when you use this trick is not stochastic, is not random. Hmm? 
is a noise that uh, from the conceptual viewpoint uh, has been clear, clearly designed to evade the classifier. It's not stochastic, it's more deterministic than stochastic. So if we come back to the question, is this classical model good for adversarial pattern recognition tasks like spam filtering? And uh, to answer this question, you consider again the two implicit assumptions that usually we take for granted. The source of data is given, and noise affecting the data is stochastic. I think that we, you, you, you agree with me after the example of spam filtering, that the answer to this question is, of course, no. Hmm? The classical model hmm? is not good. Why is not good? Because after considering spam filtering, should, clear, should be clear enough that, uh, well, the problem is quite different. Hmm? It's quite different. The source of data is not more fixed. Hmm? Quite clear from the example of spamming. Hmm? And noise affecting the data cannot be considered simply a stochastic noise, Gaussian noise, or any other kind of random noise. Uh, it's something that uh, we could call, uh, at the first sight, uh, adversarial noise. It's a noise just designed to maximize the error of our classifier. In our example, to maximize the error of our anti-spam filter. So it's more adversarial noise than uh, uh, stochastic noise, a random noise. Consider that uh, this distinction between uh, adversarial noise and uh, random noise, stochastic noise, is not new. It's not new. If you are familiar with communication theory, well, probably you already heard about the distinction between stochastic noise and adversarial noise because it's, it's a concept very well known in information theory and so in, uh, in communication theory because comes from the distinction introduced uh, by Shannon and uh, Richard Hemming. Yeah, the, 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 fir the, the first kind of noise used in, in information theory was the, the probabilistic noise, the random noise used uh, by and proposed by, by Shannon to model the noise over a transmission channel. But after a few years, uh, Richard Hemming proposed a different kind of noise that uh, he called adversarial noise that is very close to the kind of noise that sometimes we consider for adversarial learning and adversarial pattern recognition because uh, it's a sort of uh, non-random worst case noise. Worst case because uh, it's a noise just designed to maximize the error of a device, in our case of our learning algorithm, of our pattern classifier. Given some constraint, given some constraint, uh, in, 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 in terms of how much noise the adversary can add. And this is a concept that uh, we'll explain clearly uh, during this tutorial. So having said that, uh, should be quite, uh, it's quite easy to, to see that uh, uh, using the classical uh, machine learning and uh, pattern recognition algorithm for adversarial tasks is not a good idea. It's not a good idea because uh, not, not because classical algorithms are not good, but because they have been uh, designed for other kind uh, of task uh, where the noise is random and not adversarial noise, uh, where the source of data is fixed and it is not changing to maximize the error of our, of our system. So, well, we need something more and we, we, we need something different to address adversarial tasks. So now the question is, how should we design pattern classifier for adversarial tasks like spam filtering? Hmm? For tasks where we clearly have an adversary, sometimes in the most of cases, a human being who is trying uh, to evade uh, our system to maximize, to increase the error of our system. 
Well, the first message to answer this question is uh, we should uh, make our learning system uh, adversary aware. We should make uh, the system aware of the presence of the adversary, because otherwise there is no way. Uh, and uh, to design adversary aware system, the first important uh, conceptual point to consider is that uh, any adversarial task, uh, as any security issue problem, uh, is an arm race. Is an arm race. Arm race is an important concept uh, in adversarial machine learning. Of course, it's not an, again a new concept. It's a very well known concept in security, in computer security and uh, in any other security fields. Because in security, it's quite clear that there is a, an arm race between uh, the adversary and the defender. But if you have an adversarial machine learning problem, you have the same, exactly the same situation. So arms race is an important concept to, to, to understand. Uh, given that, let me spend a few slides to give you an example of what is uh, uh, and what could be the arm, an arm race uh, in the context of uh, a machine learning and pattern recognition problem. So let, let, me, let me mention a famous example of arm race uh, in our field uh, related to what is called uh, image spam. I, 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 I use this example because it's quite easy to understand even if uh, you are not so familiar with uh, spam filtering because it's quite intuitive. And this is the story. It's a short story that I want to, to tell you. Uh, some years ago, well now it's, uh, it's already more than 10 years ago, uh, about in 2004, uh, there was a, a new kind of spam. Hmm? Because uh, well, at the, between 2004 and 2006, there was a large uh, new spam uh, dissemination because the spammers, uh, they invented at that time a new trick that was after called image-based spam. And the trick was very simple. And that time, the anti-spam filters, usually they didn't inspect, they didn't analyze uh, the attachments of the emails. And so well, what the spammers at that time realized that was very simple to fool, to evade anti-spam filters, simply embedding the, their spam messages inside images sent as attachments. Why? Because at that time, the, the filters, they didn't analyze it, the attachment especially images attached to the email. And so, well, of course, the job was done easily, the job of evading anti-spam. Well, in my laboratory, at that time, we were interested in spam filtering, and we also had a good tradition in computer vision. And so we proposed a countermeasure against these this kind, this new kind uh, of spam messages. And uh, well, the countermission that we proposed was very, very simple, very simple. We simply proposed to uh, equip anti-spam filter with OCR, optical character recognition capabilities, and to make anti-spam filters able to extract the text inside images, inside attachment containing text. And so well, we, 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 we were also able to develop uh, a new kind of anti-spam filter who was much more effective against this kind of spam. And after publishing a paper, we also uh, developed a plugin for the spam assassin uh, uh, anti-spam filter, uh, and so making this tool able to filter also this uh, new kind of spam, uh, called uh, image-based spam. But then the, the interesting part of the story is what happened immediately after that we deployed uh, this new plugin. 
After a while, we realized that the spammers invented a new trick in response to this new tool. And the trick was this. You see, it's quite easy to understand. What they did, they simply uh, corrupted the, 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 the spam messages, the images containing the spam messages, in order to make impossible for optical character recognition to read the character and to extract the text. But at the same time, making more or less the text understandable for human beings. So this is a clear example of arm race in the sense that uh, when uh, you, as a defender, invent a new defense mechanism, usually immediately, if there is, of course, an incentive to do that uh, for the adversary, the adversary invent uh, a, new a, a new trick to, to evade uh, the, the countermeasure that you invented. By the way, in this case, the spammers, they were quite uh, smart because uh, to invent this trick, uh, they exploited what uh, was proposed uh, for a very different uh, end, for a the very different end. Well, I imagine that if you look uh, if you look for a while to this image, uh, you can uh, guess uh, where you already seen uh, this kind of images. In, it's a different context. Any idea? Do you, have, do you remember when sometimes uh, you want to access uh, to websites and the website before uh, giving you the access ask you something or ask you to prove something about your ability. CAPTCHA, exactly, CAPTCHA. What is the rationale behind CAPTCHA? The rationale behind CAPTCHA is that uh, you have to prove that you are a human being and you are not a bot, you are not a software algorithm. And so, well, the rationale behind CAPTCHA is that uh, they exploit the matter of fact that the reading distorted camouflaged characters uh, uh, is possible for human beings, but it's very difficult for software algorithms. By the way, in this case, the spammer used for the opposite aim exactly the same uh, rationale that is behind, uh, is behind CAPTCHA. Uh, with my laboratory, we reacted mm, and we proposed another version of the plugin uh, uh, that was aimed uh, to analyze the background of images and in order to understand uh, when the background uh, has a strange texture, texture a stra is, is, is too strange to be a legal email. And so we, we developed another countermeasure. But uh, well, I, I stop the story here now because I hope that uh, now it's more clear what is the harm race within the context of machine learning and pattern recognition. If you are interested, you can find uh, the, 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 the whole story about image-based spam on Wikipedia. So, after have, having explained the concept of arrays, now, uh, let me uh, put on the table another question. How can we design adversary-aware machine learning system? Because uh, now I hope that you agree with me that uh, we need to make uh, our algorithms aware of the presence of the adversary, because it's important. Otherwise, we risk that uh, our algorithm is not able to take into account the arm race between the adversary and the machine learning system. Well, uh, if you look at the state of the art of this field, uh, at the end of this tutorial, I will tell you something more about the story of this field, adversarial machine learning. But it's a recent field. The first paper uh, has been published in 2004. It's quite recent. But if you look at the state of the art, uh, you can answer to this question, how can we design good systems for adversarial uh, tasks? Uh, you can summarize uh, the state of the art to answer to this question with these rules mm, that I like to call the three golden rules to design 
adversarial machine learning system. The first is you should know your adversary. The second is uh, you should be proactive in the design of your system. And the third is you should design countermeasures against the possible attacks. So now let me exp so, so now these three rules summarize what you should do if you are a designer of a machine learning system for adversarial applications. So let, let me say something about uh, these three rules and then in the rest of the tutorial we will go into the technical details with, with my colleague Battista. So the first rule is know your adversary. Uh, again, uh, is something that can appear new in the field of computer vision, machine learning, but is uh, a very well-known classical rule in any security field. If you don't know your adversary, you have no, no way, no hope uh, in any security problem. So it's something that you have to do. But what does it mean, know your adversary? Means that uh, you must build a model of your adversary. That uh, more precisely means that uh, you should do some assumptions about your adversary. Hmm? You cannot uh, pretend to defend your system if you don't uh, do some assumption about uh, what the adversary in front of you can do and w which are the capabilities of your adversary. So the first thing is uh, to create a model of your adversary. And if you look at the state of the art of this field of advers adversarial machine learning, there are three main features that you should consider to create a model of the adversary that you suppose is, is your opponent, is against you, is in front of you. The first is to define what is the goal of the adversary. The second is what the adversary knows about your system, your machine learning system, that is the adversary knowledge. And the third is what the adversary can do against your system. What is the adversary capability? Let me say something about the goal. How can you characterize the goal of your adversary? Well, it's not difficult because first thing, the most of adversarial learning problems are two class problems. Well, in this tutorial, we will see some cases of multiple classes adversarial problem, but in the most of cases, it's a two class. There are legal good patterns and malicious bad patterns. Imagine spam filtering is a two class problem. And uh, if you consider this scenario a two class problem, it's quite easy to understand the, the adversary goal. If you imagine a two-class problem, it's easy to see that uh, there are two kinds of errors that you can have. One is missed alarm, when uh, the system is, on, is not able to detect uh, a malicious pattern, in some cases an attack pattern. And the other, is, the other error is false alarm. Hmm? When, uh, you raise an alarm even if the input to your machine learning system is a, is a good input, is a legal input. So if you consider this, it becomes immediately clear that the adversary goal can be to maximize false alarm rates or to maximize the miss alarm rate. Depending on what your adversary wants to do against your system, you have two main kinds of goals. One is called denial of service goal, denial of service attack, when uh, your adversary was to wants to increase the false alarm rates. And the other is uh, evasion attack, when the goal of the adversary is to evade your system and so to increase the miss alarm rate. And these are the two main kind of attack. What is the message? The message is, and we will see the technical detail later, before designing your system, you should make an assumption. What do you expect? You expect that the goal of your adversary is to increase 
false alarms or miss alarms. Depending on these, uh, you should uh, uh, change the design of your of your system because you you cannot or you cannot or it's very difficult to protect your system from any kind of attack. And in, in some cases, it's too expensive to do that. So it's important to define what is the goal of the adversary. I mean, to make an assumption, because you have to make assumptions. The other important uh, uh, feature, angle to consider to model your adversary is to understand what is the knowledge of the adversary? What can you expect? that the adversary knows about your system. Hmm? One uh, simple assumption is that uh, the adversary knows everything. Hmm? The, the knowledge of the adversary is perfect, know everything. What does it mean? The adversary knows the training data that you use uh, to train your learning algorithm. The adversary knows uh, which kind of features you are using. Hmm? and also knows uh, exactly the learning algorithm that you are using. And so know, knows everything. Do you think that is a, a realistic assumption or is it too pessimistic? Any, any idea about uh, how much uh, this assumption that your adversary knows everything about your machine learning and pattern recognition system is a realistic assumption or not? Do you think, well, let's say a binary question. Do you think that is realistic? Yes or no? Yes? How many? No. Yes. Do you think that it can be? Yes. Well, let's say that, uh, yeah, it's not impossible. Imagine that your system is open source. It's open source. You, you developed your machine learning system, and you, you are providing mm, this, the system as an open source tool. So you are, pro you are providing the code, you are providing everything. In this case, the adversary, well, knows everything. Can use the, your system, can do experiments, and can assess the performance, and so on. So in some cases, yes, the adversary can know everything. And so you should consider these. In other cases, can be a too pessimistic assumption. Because in other cases, uh, the knowledge of the adversary can be limited. For example, if you are, sorry, if you are sure that uh, while it's very difficult to, that the adversary can get the access to the training data that you use, uh, you can assume that uh, the knowledge is limited. And so you can leverage on this assumption. And so you, you can assume that you, you don't have to protect your, your system against this kind of knowledge because the adversary probably uh, is, is not likely to know the training data. Uh, behind this reasoning, there is a, a famous principle, very well known in security, hmm? that is the Kharkov principle, that uh, states an important thing that is also very important in machine learning and pattern recognition when you deal with, with adversarial tasks. That is that, uh, when you design a system for a security task, you should not, uh, not rely too much on the assumption that uh, there are some many things, many, inform many information that uh, for sure the adversary cannot know. Hmm? So well, someone say that uh, is not a good thing uh, to rely on the assumption that you can get uh, security by ob obscurity. That means that you can uh, imagine that your system is secure because the adversary knows nothing or knows little, little, uh, little information about the system. What is much better is what is written in the last sentence of this slide. The best thing that you have to do is to try to assess the robustness of your system, the robustness of your machine learning system, under different assumptions about the adversary knowledge. This is the best thing, and in the tutorial later, we will show what this means in practical terms, how you should assess the performance of your learning system under different uh, 
levels of knowledge of the adversary. Of course, we are speaking of uh, different levels that you can uh, uh, assume. And so you should assess the performance under different uh, assumptions. Another important thing is the capability, the capability of the adversary. Hmm? What is the capability? What the adversary can do make an assumption about should you imagine that the adversary uh, will attack your system when the system is under training while you are training your learning algorithm to inject as inputs to your system some bad data with uh, wrong uh, labels so that uh, while the, the learning phase of your system is misleaded or you imagine that the adversary will be attacking your system at the test time during the operation. This is against, uh, is against sorry, another thing that uh, you should make an assumption and you should make an assumption about what is more likely. If it's more likely an attack uh, at training time or the test time. Uh, the attack at training time is also called poisoning. And it's becoming an important uh, and a serious issue for many systems using machine learning able to do some kind of incremental learning. Because if your system is able to do incremental learning, and uh, the task that your system is addressing is a security task. You could imagine that someone, the adversary, could uh, try to use the learning stage of your system to mislead the system. Suppose that the adversary is able to provide, uh, during the learning phase, some bad data. I mean, some data with wrong labels, wrong classification labels. This is not just a poisoning uh, attacks during the, the training time. It's not just a, an, a completely hypothetical attack. I don't know if you heard a few years ago about this strange case. A strange case that happened uh, to the Microsoft chatbot tie. Well, for a short period of time, Microsoft make available over the internet a chatbot, and Microsoft claimed at the time that while this chatbot was using artificial intelligence and was able to learn by chatting with people uh, while on Twitter. But uh, well, the, the strange story, in some sense, the funny story is that uh, at a given time, uh, Microsoft was obliged to switch off this chatbot because they realized that, uh, well, this uh, chatbot uh, was starting to use a very offensive uh, well, style of talking. Mm? And why? Because, well, the the the. the the hypothesis, and, and it's, quite, it's quite close to, 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 to the reality, is that uh, some young guys, they understood uh, more or less uh, which kind of learning mechanism uh, this chatbot was using, and so they started uh, to do conversations with this chatbot using uh, offensive sentences, using offensive words. And after a while, the chatbot was poisoned during the, the training time and started to use a very offensive word. And so Microsoft was obliged to switch off the, the chatbot. Well, this is in some sense uh, a, a, a probably example of poisoning attack uh, in the wild, in, in the real environment. Uh, adversary capability is another important thing. What the adversary can do of course, well, can attack the system at test time. Another important thing is what the adversary can do to manipulate the patterns that becomes, become the input patterns to your system. Well, the first important message is that likely the adversary is not omnipotent. 
in, for all the real adversarial problems, tasks, there are some limitations that any adversary has due to the fact that uh, while uh, the adversary cannot do everything to manipulate the patterns, if, if the adversary can do everything, there is no chance, there is no way. You cannot protect the system, but likely the adversary has some limitation. For instance, usually the adversary has clear limitation on the amount of manipulation that uh, the adversary can do on your data. For instance, there is a, for poisoning attacks, for attacks during the training time, there is a, a limited number of sample that uh, the adversary can miss can change, changing the classification label, and to provide the system as training patterns. During the test time, again, for the most, I believe, the, 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 the whole, the practical security problem, there is a maximum amount of modification that any adversary can do to manipulate the patterns, the input data to your machine learning system, oh. okay. to, to evade the system. Hmm? Look at that, uh, at that uh, I don't know what, what happened. Sorry, but it's out of my control. <laughs> Let me try. Apparently, I don't know if there is someone in the room that is the assistant. Yeah, you? Okay, thank you very much. Because it, it, it depends on the, on the control room, on the projector, and I, I can do nothing. Sorry for the interruption. Anyway, while I was speaking about the capability of the adversary, and even if there is no, well, no picture, it's again a wall, and it's something that we will see clearly. Uh, some limitation for the adversary to manipulate the patterns is quite clear for a problem like spam filtering, but it's also quite clear for many, many other uh, other adversarial tasks. And this is the the good uh, part of the story. And uh, well, is uh, in some sense represented well by the picture that you see on the on the right uh, bottom part of the slide. Okay. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah. Anyway, okay. And uh, keep in mind <laughs> Keep in mind uh, No, sorry. Uh, yeah, it's not the right day. <laughs> okay. Okay, I wait for a while so we before Maybe I can. Okay. Let's see if it works. And uh, keep in mind that the picture that you see, because uh, it's an important concept that we, we will describe uh, in details later. And it is a conceptual representation. You see, there, are, there is a, an hypothetical feature space, just two dimensions. And the X, the dot point, the, the, the red point, sorry, X, is an hypothetical pattern. And the X apex is the pattern after the modifications that uh, one adversary does uh, just to evade uh, an hypothetical machine learning system, you see the decision boundary. 
likely we will see in the rest of the tutorial that uh, th there are practical limi limitations for any adversary for any practical task uh, so that uh, any adversary cannot do for practical reason too many modifications to the patterns because otherwise it will be very easy to evade any machine learning system but consider spam for instance it's easy to see that uh, to understand that uh, you can, the spammer can modify some words of the spam message, but not too many. Why? Because otherwise, the message, the spam message, is not more understandable, and you don't buy nothing. The message does not uh, does not arrive to to the to the to the to people. Okay. This is okay. Okay. Let's do that. Uh, it's time for coffee break. Uh, we, we, we go to the coffee break and we hope that uh, when we start again at 3.30, the projector uh, work well. Sorry for the interruption, but well, we explore the fact that there is a coffee break. Okay, we, we, we start again. Well, uh, the, the last things that I want to, to tell you what was about uh, the capability of the adversary. That is the, the last concept that I want uh, to introduce you uh, for uh, uh, the modeling of, of the adversary. So what the adversary can do. And usually for a practical adversarial problem, uh, what can do is uh, a matter of the constraints that the adversary has. Uh, in particular, in terms of the modifications that the adversary can do to the patterns, which are the inputs to your system, to your pattern recognition system. You see that, uh, keep in mind that, that, that uh, picture, because uh, it's a, an abstract representation that we will use uh, uh, later in other parts of the tutorial, is a representation of the modification that an, an adversary, a given adversary, can do to the, the, the data, the pattern X modified to a pattern X apex uh, in order to evade uh, a given uh, pattern classifier represented as the, a decision boundary. This is quite, uh, uh, an, it's quite an important concept to understand uh, the capability of the adversary. Usually, we are lucky in practical problem because the amount of modifications that the adversary can do as uh, a constraint, we will say something in details later, is a constraint in terms of a maximum amount of modification that can be expressed, you see in the slide, as uh, a threshold of uh, a distance measure, D max, hmm? D max, the maximum amount uh, of modification that the adversary can do. Uh, all in all, uh, when you f think about the adversary capability, there is this principle uh, that in security, in computer security, is, con is, is called conservative design. And again, is a principle that, that uh, suggests to you that the best thing to do is to consider different scenarios in terms of different level of capability that the adversary can have so that you can assess the performances and the vulnerability, the security of your system considering different uh, uh, degrees of capabilities, the different level of capability, so different attacks that the adversary can carry out against uh, your system. Well, this is the part uh, that we, we have discussed about uh, modeling the adversary. Hmm? Do you remember? So considering the goal of the adversary, the knowledge that the adversary can have uh, or has of your system, and the capability, which are three dimensions which are very important uh, to create a model of your adversary. The second part uh, is uh, being proactive. Hmm? Trying to understand uh, in advance, being proactive, what the adversary can do against the system, against your machine learning pattern recognition system. And here I leave the word to, to my co-tutorialist, co Battista. Please. Okay, so thanks. Thanks Fabio for passing me this part of the tutorial. So 
As Fabio said, we are now approaching the part on be proactive, which is the second golden rule uh, among the three ones we've seen before. And the idea here is uh, actually to exploit the model we've seen to hypothesize and figure out potential attacks against our pattern classifier in general. So the question here, and, and the goal of this will be to, in the end, try to anticipate the attacker. So we try to break machine learning algorithm and then figure out what happens to design some secure learning algorithm. And uh, so the question, the main question I'll be, I'll, I'll be addressing here is um, how to craft optimal attacks in some sense against the learning algorithm and what happens to the performance of the classifier under attack. So in some sense, the idea is to measure some empirical bounds on the performance of the classifier under different kinds of attack scenarios. And among all the possible attack scenarios that you can um, hypothesize with, with the model, we identify two main uh, attack settings. One is, is named evasion attacks, and here it follows the same line Fabio was, was discussing with the example on spam filtering. So the goal here is to manipulate malicious samples at test time to have them um, classified as legitimate by the learning algorithm. The knowledge in this case can be perfect or limited, and we'll see more in details uh, what this means. And clearly, we have also to uh, make some assumption on the capability, which in, in this case it's related to how you can manipulate data to evade detection. So for example, one, one clear example here is if you have a malicious software, a malware or a computer virus, and you want that specific instance to be misclassified as, as benign or legitimate, you can manipulate data, but the constraint is that the malware still has to exploit some malicious functionality, and, and so the, exploit, the exploitation code has to be preserved. So the attacker cannot do any kind of modifi modifications in the code. He is constrained in this sense. And the other main uh, attack scenario is called poisoning, and we will see this more in detail later, but the, the main idea here is that the attacker can craft instances at training time, so he can add can inject some training data into your, into your training set with the goal of causing a denial of service at test time. That means with the idea of uh, causing as many errors, classification errors as possible when the system operates. <clears throat> so let's start with the evasion attack uh, setting. And here we've already seen in the first part of the tutorial which is the underlying idea behind evading linear classifier. In this case, it's quite easy because there is a clear relationship, a relationship between the features that you have and the inter, the, the So, for example, if you have a spam email, which is characterized by a set of bad words, like this one depicted here, so you have the bad words in your dictionary are start, bank, portfolio, winner, and year. And they are, as you can see, they are associated to positive weights. So here the assumption is that positive means malicious. And the classifier gives these features a positive weight in the sense that it retains they are bad words. So they are learned as, as bad words. Whereas you have some legitimate words which are assigned a negative weight. So the negative class is, is legitimate here. And as you can see, this email is correctly classified as spam because to see that you have just to sum up the weights corresponding to the words find, found in the email. So in this case, you have to sum up the weight plus two for start, plus one for bang, etc. right? So the score is six and assuming a threshold of zero here, you correctly classify this email as spam. So a common trick to evade uh, this classifier is to just slightly change the content of the spam email in such a way that the message is still readable to humans, but the email is misclassified by the, by, the, by the learning algorithm, right? So the idea is simply to obfuscate the bad words. Okay. The idea is to 
obfuscate the bad words, like you change some of the characters, for example, you change A to 4, which is still readable and understandable to humans, but now the machine does no longer identify correctly that word. And so what happens is that the corresponding features are modified from 1, which means the word is present in the email, to 0, which means now it's absent. Okay, so this, in some sense, make this word disappear uh, from the machine detection. Whereas the attacker can also add good words, trying to guess which, un which are the good words learned by your filter. And in this case, you can see that we add just a word which is campus, okay, which is assigned a negative weight. So now, if you recompute the score for this modified spam message, you find that you have a contribution from the bad words, which is plus three, and the contribution from the good words, which is just campus, of minus four. And if you sum up that, it's minus one, which is lower than zero, and then this email is misclassified as legitimate, as ham email. Okay, so is this clear to everybody? So it's very easy in this case to understand how to fool this kind of classifier. And then the question is, what happens if the classifier is nonlinear? Because if the classifier is nonlinear, you don't have any clear relationship between the input mapping and the input and the output mapping, right? You don't know why certain decisions are taken, which are the features more, most responsible for those decisions and so on. And in fact, at that time, we're talking about 2012, 2013, people believed that non-classifier, uh, non-linear classifiers uh, were more secure, or generally more secure, and this, this is an example of, uh, of a paper by Nedim Sherndich and Pavel Laskov, which, is, which was published at uh, a top tier security conference, which is NDSS. And they explicitly say this. Um, the most aggressive evasion strategy we could conceive was successful for only a tiny fraction of malicious examples. So this was done in the context of PDF malware detection, so the detection of computer viruses within embedded in PDF files. And they just say, uh, our attack, the, the best one we, we could think of, was just effective for a tiny percentage of samples when, we, when it was targeting a nonlinear classifier, which in this case was an SVM with the Gaussian kernel, with the RBF kernel. And they motivate this, this uh, idea by saying the problem is that it's very difficult to invert this kind of nonlinear transformation that you have from input to output in nonlinear classifiers. So that was the main um, claim they, make, they made. And they also said that the same attack staged against linear classifiers had kind of 50% success rate. So the robustness of the RBF SVM, so the SVM with the Gaussian kernel, must be root in its nonlinear transformation. So this was the main claim of the paper. So since it's very difficult to understand what this classifier is doing, we think it's more secure than linear classifiers. So now, what do you think? Is this right to some extent? Is not right? Are, more, more, are nonlinear classifiers more secure than linear ones? Any ideas? It's different, yes. Yeah. Anybody else? So who assumes uh, nonlinear classifiers are better than linear ones in terms of security against evasion attacks? Please raise your hand if you believe they are more secure. If you have one, two, three, okay. That's reasonable. And then when I read this, I called the authors because I, I knew them because I was in an internship at, at the same university in Germany for a year, or one year before this. And I called them and I said, hey, what if we just try to cast this problem as an optimization problem. So what, what the attacker is aiming to do here is to evade detection. So every classifier more or less has, uh, gives an output score to a sample, which represents in some sense the confidence of classification. You can think of that as a posterior probability for a given class, right? So if you have a binary classifier, two class classifier, you have a single output typically, and in this case, without loss of generality, you can assume that the more positive the output is, 
the more the, the point, the data sample is retained malicious. Okay? So the, and this score is denoted with G. So G is the discriminant function in this slide. And the idea was, okay, the attacker wants to evade detection, which, which means he wants to minimize the classifier score because they want my spam email or my uh, malware sample to be misclassified as, as legitimate, and therefore I want to cross the boundary towards a negative score. Is this clear to everybody? Okay. So we just say I want to minimize the output of my classifier, which means maximizing the probability of evasion in some sense. And of course, I have some constraints in terms of the manipulations that I can make on, on the sample. And this was uh, what Fabio's been discussing before. So for example, in spam, you have to set, you can set a limit on the number of words you, which you can modify. In malware, you can have a limit on the kind of instructions you can change in the code and things like that. So generally, you have a constraint optimization problem and the goal is to minimize this function. The knowledge in this case is perfect because we started from the, from the uh, easiest case where let's say the attacker knows everything about the classifier and let's see if he's able to invert this complex mapping to evade detection. So what happens here is that, okay, this is a nonlinear optimization problem in general, so you can use a straightforward gradient descent approach to find evasion points. And therefore, what happens is that is then as soon as you try to minimize um, this function by following the gradient descent, you find, for example, a minimum, uh, a minima on this constraint domain. And this can be applied to any uh, nonlinear classifier which has a dis uh, differentiable function, which is the case of support vector machines if the kernel is, is differentiable and neural networks in general. And these are just two examples of how the gradient can be computed, right? Now, if you are, if you are playing with TensorFlow, you, you are not even required to compute these expressions, but um, I'm a fan of computing things analytically to some extent, so I just wrote them down. <laughs> Sorry? Okay. And uh, so these are just examples on how we can compute the gradient. And this is what happens when you play with the MNIST digits. So if you consider a binary problem of distinguishing between threes and sevens, in this case, and now you assume three is in some sense the malicious class, and you want to manipulate this digit to have it misclassified as seven, you can do that by running this simple uh, gradient descent strategy. And um, what happens is that few modifications to the input image, so here the features are directly the pixels of, of the image, and just few modifications are enough to evade detection. So you don't even, don't even have to modify the tree to resemble a seven. You have just, in this case, to delete or add some, some pixels to the image. And so this is uh, the very first adversarial example that we showed in 2013. Uh, I'm sure you know about adversarial examples now, but this is precisely, basically the same thing. So it's, it's an evasion attack against a uh, machine learning algorithm. So actually, nonlinear classifiers are not secure. And the simple trick you can use to evade them is just to compute the gradient of their output with respect to the inputs and modify the features accordingly. That's the main idea. But one may argue at this point, well, this was devised assuming perfect knowledge of the system. So you, in some sense, you're cheating. What if the attacker doesn't have perfect knowledge of the system? So you don't know G of X analytically, and you don't even know the parameters of your learning algorithm, like the feature weights or the weights assigned by the SVM to the training points, whatever you like. Well, in this case, we exploited another simple idea, uh, which was the following. So we assume that the attacker can collect some what we call surrogate data, which means you can have um, a copy of the data that was used to train the target classifier. So for example, if you want to craft an attack against the MNIST digit data, 
even if you don't know exactly which portion has been used to train the target classifier, you can use another portion. So that's the main idea. So having this data, then you can feed the data to the system, to the target system. You can query the system and get the labels back, and you can relabel your data using feedback from the targeted system. Now this is quite common in several application settings. For example, assume that you want to evade uh, the Google anti-spam filter of Gmail. So you can craft your spam emails, send them to a fake account you create on Gmail, and check whether the email gets in or not. So, and then, by observing this, you can just infer the label that the classifier has assigned to these samples. And then you can create this surrogate data with new labels provided by the targeted classifier. Once you do that, guess what? You can essentially train a copy of the classifier that you're attacking, which we call surrogate classifier, or substitute model, as you wish. And now what you can do is design your attack samples against your surrogate classifier, and once you have these samples, send them to the targeted classifiers, so the, to the true classifier that you want to evade. That's the main idea behind this kind of limited knowledge uh, attack. And this trick can also be used to attack classifiers which are non-differentiable, like decision trees or random forests. Essentially, okay, I have to reboot the mic sometimes. Uh, the idea is to approximate this uh, non-differentiable classifier with something which is differentiable, like an SVM, which is nice and smoother, on which you can, you can run gradient descent quite easily, and then, again, send the attack sample to evade the first classifier. So in this case, you have on top um, a decision tree, which is approximated by an SVM below. You can craft the evasion point, which is the big green dot, in the plot below, and as you can against the SVM, and then you just send it again to see what happens in the other classifier. And as a result, here this sample is going is able to evade detection also by the random forest because it ends up in the blue area, which is the legitimate region. Okay. And this was a trick we exploited in 2013. Then there is, and this is basically the same underlying idea which has been exploited more recently by Nicholas Papernot and other authors in uh, some other security conferences where the goal was okay, where the goal was a bit different and it was to steal some learning model provided as a service. So assuming that you provide your, your model in the cloud to do classifications, you can conceive some queries, an attacker can conceive some queries then to steal your model. But the idea is essentially this one, it's the same. And we, we run some experiments on uh, malware detection in PDF files. So here for those who are less familiar with this setting, there are some approaches that simply look at the structure of the PDF file. So normally PDF files are uh, containers and if you open a PDF file with a text editor, you just see something similar to what you have in the slide. You have keywords, which are highlighted with colors, and then you have objects that follow up, that follow up these keywords. So for example, you may have type, page, and coding. Those are all specific keywords for denoting a specific kind of object. And some approaches just look at the occurrence of these keywords in the PDF uh, structure to judge the file as malicious or legitimate. Okay, so the idea is just to use as features, you can use the keywords, simply keyword counts. So how many time types occur, page, and so on. <clears throat> Here, we have to put an additional constraint on the attacker's capability, because the problem is you cannot remove objects easily from PDF files without compromising their intrusive functionality. So if you remove some of these keywords, it may happen that the exploitation code does not work anymore. And so the idea is to consider only injection of content in the PDF, in the PDF file. So you can instead add content, add keywords, without compromising the nature of the, of the PDF uh, malware. Okay? And this can be simply encoded uh, 
with a kind of box constraint where you see um, you impose that all the feature values of the modified um, sample X prime are greater or equal to those of the source sample of the initial malware. Okay? So that is a simple box constraint. And we did some experiments on this, and I'm just showing the results here. So the plots show on the y axis you have the evasion rate, which is the probability of the attack to succeed. While, while on the x axis you have the number of injected objects. So, what happens is that for an increasing number of injected objects, clearly the evasion rate uh, increases. And of course, the number of injected objects is measured using a distance in feature space, which in this case is the L1 distance. It's just using the L1 norm between counts gives you the number of injected objects. And what you can also notice from the plots is that both linear and nonlinear classifiers are quite vulnerable and you can also see that the solid lines and the dashed lines are quite close together representing respectively the perfect knowledge and limited knowledge cases. So having little knowledge of how the classifier work is not a big problem if you can approximate it reliably with, with this trick of surrogate learning. Okay, so the 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 common message here is that both linear and nonlinear classifiers are vulnerable to evasion attacks, and um, the performance of such systems should be always evaluated with respect to an increasing capability of the attacker, which in this case was um, a number of injected objects into the PDF file, because this gives you a complete overview of how the classifier behaves in, this, in such an adversarial setting. Okay. <clears throat> so, if if you don't have any questions, I'm, I'm moving on. With a couple of slides, I just want to point out what happened in 2014. It happened that the community of deep learning was starting to get into the field of adversarial learning, and the famous paper, which connects um, the two areas of research in some sense, is this one. Intriguing Properties of Neural Networks, uh, co-authored by Christian Jedi and Young Goodfellow, where they started from a different goal. They started from the idea of understanding why neural networks are, in, are not stable. And what they discovered as a side effect was that tiny modifications to input images, if crafted along the gradient direction, were able to evade detection. So how many of you have seen this image before? Please raise your hand. Okay, so you know, you know what we're talking about. And here the idea was, so you start from a school bus, you add some noise, which in that figure is magnified for the sake of visibility, and what you get is, a, is pretty much the same image. I mean, no one would argue that the two school buses are different in, the, in those peaks, do you? But what happens is that the first image is on the left hand side is classified correctly by the deep neural network, whereas the second one is classified as an ostrich. And to this end, you just need to add a tiny, small perturbation to the input. But the idea was pretty much the same we exploited for the other end in, in evasion attacks. So just following the gradient path to design this kind of adversarial noise. They cast the problem in a slightly different way, because here the goal was not that of maximizing the posterior probability of the classifier, or said another way, the confidence that the classifier assigns to the, to the sample for, for, the for the desired class, but the idea was just to minimize the, number, the, the perturbation, given that the sample is misclassified. So that, what, that is what this uh, optimization problem um, describes. Example field of research, and so I invite you to Google for adversarial examples and see how many papers <laughs> we had in the last two or three years about these topics. Now, in the next set of slides, um, 
I'm, I'm, I want to pose another, another case to your attention, which is um, what about the security of uh, robot vision systems to this threat? So, and, and for this case, we consider the uh, popular ICAB uh, robot from the Italian Institute of Technology. Um, do you know this, this robot, anyone? Have you seen that somehow? So this was developed in the context of, uh, of the project, the European project Robot Cab, and it has different motors and sensors to move here and see. But here we focus just on the visual uh, system that it uses. That it uses, and it, it is able, in particular, to recognize objects in images using visual features using deep network, deep learning. So. It extracts features, deep features from images, and it learns a classifier on top of that to discriminate several objects. So the underlying idea is that you have the um, robot vision system acquiring images, and then these are automatically cropped around the object of interest, and the object of interest, which is a cup in this, in this um, slide, it is then fed to uh, the image net network up to the penultimate layer of the network, which is FC7 in the slide. And what the authors of this, um, of the proposal of this ICAB uh, vision system did was essentially to replace the last layer um, of, of, the, of this network with a simple linear multi-class classifier to implement a kind of incremental learning uh, mechanism on the on the embodied in the robot. So the idea is that you can um, add new classes, new kinds of objects can be learned by the robot while operating. So you can you can show him, you can show it a new object, and then if it's misclassified, you can say this object is not a cup as you believed. For example, this object is rather a new class of objects that you don't know. For example, a dish, uh, dish, dish water detergent or something. And, and in this way, you can essentially augment the set of classes, the set of objects that the bot knows. So that's why they replace the last layer in this, in this kind of architecture. This is the data set used in, in the experiments to show how the robot is effective in recognizing objects. And there are seven main classes of objects, which are respectively laundry detergent, plate, dishwashing detergent, sponge, cups, soap, and sprayer. And then for each category, you have further four subclasses, which denote objects from the same different objects from the same category. So as you can see from the, from the slide, it's pretty clear. So our goal here is to see how can we manipulate objects to evade detection, to fool this bot, this robot, um, during operation. And to this end, we cannot actually use the version of the evasion attack I've been describing before because we, we've been dealing with two classes, right? So in this case, we have to deal with the problem of uh, multi-class classification. And the main issue here is that you don't have a single, let's say, option for, for, for the meaning of misclassification. So when you have two classes and you say, I want this object to be misclassified, there's just one possibility which it is misclassified as an object of the other class. So if it's a spam email, it can only be misclassified as a legitimate email, and vice versa. If you have multiple classes, you have to specify which kind of error you would like to, to achieve as an attacker. So if you have a cup, you may want the cup to be misclassified as any other object different from the cup, or you may also want to specify which class you want the cup to be assigned to. For example, I want the cup to be uh, classified as a sprayer. Okay, so you have different possibilities, and we named that um, error-specific and error-generic attacks. So error-generic attack is, is in the case where you just want a misclassification error in any of the possible classes. You're not interested in having a specific error. Instead, in error-specific attacks, the idea is to specify also the target class. So I want this object to be misclassified as a specific instance of this other class, okay? And now, um, 
the idea here in multi-class evasion is to try to identify which is the shortest path in some sense that you have to follow in the feature space to be misclassified as something else and which mean, in the other case it was just a gradient of the discriminant function but here is something different because the class boundaries are obtained as a combination of um, scores or confidence outputs for different classes. In particular, if you just consider the, the multi-class case and a linear classifier exactly as the ICAB setting, you have that the class boundaries among these three classes are identified as differences between the so-called competing classes, that is the classes which exhibit the highest support for, for the given sample. So for example, if you have three, three distinct binary classifiers here, red against everything, blue against everything, and green against everything, denoted with F1, F2, and F3, the multi-class decision boundary, which is the black one, is just determined by subtracting F1 and F2 between the red and the blue class, and so on and so forth. So just to, to cut it short, the main idea I want to convey here is that the boundary depends now on the difference between the two classes with the IGAS support for, for, for the given point. And therefore, our objective will look like, look like uh, this omega function, where you have a fixed class, the fi this, a support for a fixed class, k, fk of x, minus the class with the IGAS support, l, chosen among the remaining set of classes. So let's make a clear example now. So in the generic, in the error generic evasion case, you, you want just to take a blue point and have it misclassified as any other class. The important thing is that the blue point is not classified as blue. So to, to achieve this, you can basically set K to be the blue class and set L as the competing class, which most likely in this example will be the red one, which just because it's the closest one to the blue in feature space. And then you just minimize this objective omega because what will happen is, on the one hand, you will minimize the contribution coming from FK, which means you minimize the support that the classifier gives to the blue class, whereas you will, maximize, will minimize minus the other term, which means you maximize the support that the classifier will give to the IGAS competing class, which in this case, the closest one, which is the red one, okay? And therefore, of course, you still have common constraints on the distance between the input sample. In this case, we use the Euclidean distance, which, is, which just draws a circle around the starting point. And, uh, and then we have a box constraint that in the case of images is just used to enforce the fact that the, image, the pixel values have, have to be within 0 and 255, 255, okay? So that's the main idea behind this generic error attack. Whereas if you consider the error specific case, you have to use the same objective but slightly adjust the interpretation of each term. So in this case, I still want the blue point to be misclassified, but in this case, I want to specify the target class and I want to have the blue point misclassified as green. So to do that, I assign k, the target class, k to the target class, so k now is the green class, and l is the competing class. So when I start, the point is the blue one, which is correctly classified as blue, so the competing class will be the blue one, okay? What I want to do this time is to maximize the objective, because I want to maximize the probability that the sample is assigned to the green class, while minimizing the probability that it is assigned to the blue one. Okay, so I want, in some sense, to transfer the probability of blue to the probability of red to have the sample misclassified as desired. And uh, after, so this is the, for the general formalization of the attack, then again, we solve this using gradient descent. And uh, basically here you have two contributions. One is given, so use the chain rule, first of all, and then 
you have to consider the derivative of the last layer, where you have this multi-class linear classifier, multiplied by the derivative of the deep feature space with respect to the input space, which is the derivative of the deep network in an end-to-end -end manner. In practice, this means that you can compute easily the derivative for the linear classifier, and then you have to propagate back the derivative uh, towards the, the deep network to have the gradient in input space. This can be easily done by automatic differentiation, which is the main strategy used by deep learning and TensorFlow, for example. So the underlying idea is just to uh, start from X, so the point you want to compute the gradient with, and you classify this sample. So every block in the computational graph, which in this case corresponds to the deep network, computes the value of the function and its first derivative, such that when you want to compute the derivative, you start back from the last layer and you apply the chain rule backwards. It's, it's the same principle of backpropagation overall. Okay. Happens when we run this attack on the ICAP data set. And as you can see, the detergent show, uh, depicted in the left plot is only slightly perturbed to be misclassified as a cup. And the maximum perturbation here in, in terms of the Euclidean distance between the original and the manipulated image is 290. So can you, can you spot the modification in this image? There is just one pixel which seems to, which seems to be green, right? close to the label of the detergent. I'm not sure you can appreciate that, but it's really hard to see. Okay, that's enough to have this um, image misclassified as a cup. And then in this work, we also, which, we, which is going to be presented tomorrow at the Viper uh, workshop anyway. In this work, we also show that um, to build real objects, actually you should only modify pixels which belong to the object in the image. So I'm not supposed to modify background pixels, right? Otherwise, how can I create the real uh, object to be displayed in front of the robot uh, to have that mis misclassified as desired? So to this end, we basically bound the perturbation to lie on the label of the object. On, and in such a way, you can design a sticker that can be applied to the object to fool the robot vision system. Okay, um, any questions so far? Yeah. Yeah. So the question is uh, that the classifier is trained essentially using a one versus all approach, and therefore it makes decision based on the whole feature space. If, if, if I'm paraphrasing you correctly, so the, the question is, what if you use rejection? And the answer is, this is a very good idea, and it what we, is what we did to counter this kind of attack, which is exactly the next part of the talk. So in the next part of the talk, which, which is actually a very simple um, slide, we discuss how, what can we do to mitigate this problem. And this is the third golden rule, according to what we, we saw before. So let me start a little bit uh, with, a, with an earlier notion with respect to this uh, idea of rejection, which is discussing what uh, one of the most popular defenses that have been used so far in deep learning, which is called adversarial training. So the idea, the basic idea here is, to, is that you have two players. One is the classifier, and the other one is the attacker. The attacker designs the evasion samples, and the classifier is retrained on top of them. So it's a kind of game theoretical framework. Now, it's very interesting because there are game theoretical approaches for convex learning algorithms which give you formal guarantees of convergence and you know, uniqueness of the game equilibrium and these kind of things. Uh, whereas in deep nets, you don't have any of these uh, nice properties. So, so far it's, it's only been shown empirically that this defense can work to some extent, okay? But what is the underlying idea? What's, 
happening to the decision surface of the classifier when you play this game between the attacker and the classifier. <clears throat> we just, I'm trying to explain this with a simple case. So let's go back to the two class classification case where you have the red points which are the malicious samples like your spam emails and you have the blue ones which are the legitimate emails. What the attacker does here is to manipulate the red objects to have them misclassified. Correct? So in the first part of the game the attacker manipulates data and evades the classifier. In the second part of the game you retrain the classifier to have these samples correctly classified again. So you retrain your learning algorithm and now you got the sample, the green sample now is correctly classified. And you can iterate this procedure several times and what happens is that gradually the classifier tends to enclose the stationary data, the data which is not manipulated by the attacker, which in this case is the blue one, right? And this is in fact uh, the underlying idea, uh, this is fact effectively why classifiers are vulnerable to this kind of attacks. The problem is um, that regions which are far away from the training data, so the data that the classifier is uh, comfortable with, that it knows that data, it can take reliable decision on those data. Points which are farther away from this data are classified basically at random depending on the specific case of training data that you have and so on. And they are classified at random either as benign or legitimate in this case just because in the assumption of data stationarity under which you train your learning algorithm you won't see any data in that regions. So that does not make any difference in terms of the classification error. However, the attacker can exploit this kind of vulnerability because now data is not stationary. So you can craft instances which are different enough from your training data and have these samples misclassified as desired. And this is pres precisely what happens in the left hand side plot which we named blind spot evasion because the classifier, the attacker is effectively exploiting this notion of blind spot regions. Regions which are far away from the training data on which the classifier basically decides at random. So if you're, if you're in some sense unlucky, you end up with a vulnerable classifier which is the one on the left, whereas if you're lucky you can end up with a classifier on the right. And in the right case, in the, in the, in the right plot, the only thing that the attacker can do to evade your learning algorithm is mimic more precisely the feature values of the target class, which eventually is what we desire to improve the security of the, of the learning algorithm. So the question here is, is that I, I'd like to have some decision functions which are enclosing legitimate data or if you, if you want to extend this to the multi-class case they are enclosing um, the, the class data, right, the training classes. Okay, and in fact the, the, the question was, was right and timely because Therefore, wh what you can do to reject this kind of blind spot evasion attacks or blind spot adversary examples if you prefer is to use rejection. So assuming that your classifier behaves in, in the following way in the sense that the confidence, the score that it, it assigns to sample decreases as far as you go from the training data. So as the farther you go from the training data, the score decreases, okay? And this is for example a property of the SVM with the Gaussian kernel. If the classifier has this property, by just setting a threshold on the support or on the posterior estimated by the classifier, then you can implement this kind of enclosed decision functions that you see on the right hand plot. And in fact, with this, uh, this is precisely the idea of rejecting. So you, you reject things which are far away from the data from the training data. And we test that in the ICAB setting to improve the security of this robot vision system and we found that for small perturbations like so in, on the x axis now you have the um, 
perturbation of the input image in terms of the Euclidean distance. So for small amount of perturbations, you have a question? Yeah, correct. So the question is if you enclose your classes you cannot generalize. That's correct. There's a price to pay, in fact. Which is that of course the more you enclose the classes, the more the false in some sense the false alarm rate increases, right? False rejection rate, or whatever you want to call it. The error increases because you reject some portion of benign data. That's that's the point. And and that's correct. In fact, if you see on the y axis, so the green and the yellow are the standard classifiers. The red one is the one with rejection, and as you can see, the initial accuracy decreases. So that's the price to pay to be able to detect some of these adversarial examples. Okay? So we're just able to detect adversarial examples within small indistinguishable perturbations, which is for lower value of uh, lower values of the um, perturbation, whereas for values which are higher than 100 or 200, we basically they become indistinguishable. And here the problem lies in the instability of the mapping learned by the deep network. So it's something we cannot patch in the ICAP robot if we use the deep network uh, given. So if, if that is given and fixed, you cannot patch this. So you have to retrain the network from scratch to avoid that problem. Okay? So if you don't have any further questions, we have now a demo session. And, uh, any questions from the audience? Yeah, please. This is an interesting question. So the question is, uh, if we exploit some kind of um, importance over samples which are misclassified to correct the classifier, like in the case of boosting and, 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 and similar. So actually, I'm not aware of these kind of defenses so far. So probably it's something that can be exploited too. I agree with you. But it's something which is somehow done to counter the other kind of attack that we will see later which is the poisoning attack. So, but actually, I think it could be used for the, for the evasion case as well. Yeah, please, another question. Yeah. Yeah, this is a good question. So the question is how to decide which metric to use to measure the input perturbation, like we used in this case the Euclidean distance, such that it aligns with the uh, human perception, the visual percep perception that you have on images. This is a good question. There are some details on the papers that L2 is slightly better because if you use an L2 constraint attack, so if you use the Euclidean distance, what you have is that the noise is essentially a blur no effect on the image. And if it's very small, then it's very difficult to notice. If you use different distances, like if you take the L1, what happens is that you have a sparse noise. So that few pixels will be modified to a very large extent in a, in a sort of salt and pepper noise, okay? So that effect could be more visible if, even if you have uh, smaller perturbations. But normally, um, there is a misconception here, which is why these samples have to be visually indistinguishable. This system is not going to operate in a supervised man, uh, manner. There will be no human, you know, checking whether this decision is right or not. So even if it's visually perceived, even if the distortion is visible, but the learning algorithm is cheated, then the attack has, has reached the goal. So this is a kind of misconception which I see in several works, but, but the question is, is definitely pertinent. Thank you. Okay, so now we have this kind of demo, so we have to connect to our website hoping that nothing crashes. 
we're moving on a shaky ground here. Okay, so this is a simple demo we developed over the last week, and uh, hopefully it works because our students uh, were working on this overnight yesterday. <laughs> And we are thankful to Ambra De Montis and Marco Melis, which are the two PhD students working on this project, along with me and Fabio. And uh, this is a simple demo where you have um, a multi-class linear SVM classifying MNIST digits. So just the kind of examples with... Okay, there's no internet. Sorry about that. Wi-Fi. Should connect to at wrong one. Okay, that was our fault, not the fault of the system this time. And uh, so I was, I was saying you know, that we are classifying MNIST digits, right? So in this demo, basically you pick the first digit, you, you, you pick one of them, so I'm, I'm taking zero here. Then I have to decide which kind of error I'd like the classifier to make. And in this case, uh, you can pick, sorry, any class which corresponds to the error generic case, or you can specify a target class, okay? In this case, I'm taking digit one, and then I have to select the maximum perturbation that, our, that the attack will be applying to the input digit, which is the Euclidean distance. In this case, I just set zero and run the evasion algorithm. <coughs> After a while, the demo should show um, the input data, which is the original one, plus the noise, which is magnified again for, um, for being visually identifiable, and the adversarial digit, so the, the adversarial attack. So in this case, they are the same because I applied no perturbation to the input. And below, you have these histograms, which denote the output of the classifier before and after the attack. The green is before the attack on the, mani the non-manipulated digit, and orange is after the attack, so on the manipulated digit. And here, as you can see, they are clearly the same because the images are the same, and you have classes. So the class the digit is assigned to, in this case, is digit zero, is the leftmost uh, displayed class because they are sorted based on the output of the classifiers. So. The one with the IGAS support is the class which is assigned to the digit. Okay, is that clear? And then here you can see some ranking. So you have digit, this digit belongs to the zero class, then you have six here. The second, class, the second candidate class is six, then you have two, five, and so on and so forth. Okay, the last one is digit one, which has a very low confidence. In this case, it's assigned minus 10. So in this case, this is the score coming from a linear SVM. So it's basically the distance to the hyperplane for that specific class. And when it's negative, it means it belongs to any of the other classes, okay? And minus 9 means this is definitely not a 0, okay? Uh, sorry, not a 1. So what we want to do now is to set target classes digit 1 and increase the perturbation. So let's put it to two, for example. Now, this is the Euclidean distance just divided by 255, but clearly, I mean, it's just a small amount of perturbation, and you run evade again. Of course, this takes a bit of time because it's computed online by a couple of workstations we have in the lab. So, here you have now the original digit and the noise and the output digit, which you can see is a, is a zero with something in between which tries to resemble a one, right? And 
let's see what happens to the classification phase. Well, this is still, if you, if you look at the orange histogram, this is still classified as a zero, even if the classifier responsible for class zero is saying this doesn't look really a zero because it, it has a negative score. However, since this is the, the maximum, um, the, the class with the maximum support, the, the digit is still assigned to class zero. Whereas one, which was in the, in the last position, has started to increase. So the confidence uh, of, of, of one, of the classifier with, for class one is increasing. And effectively, if you now increase the perturbation, for example, if you go to four, I'm not sure whether it's going to happen, You go to f if you increase the perturbation up to four, now you have the, the digit is misclassified as one, and you can see it here. And now if you go and look at the histogram, you see that one is the class with the highest confidence in this case, okay? If the perturbation is lower, like three, then it will happen that it could be misclassified, but as a different class, not as a one, but maybe as a two or a four, some class which is in between. And the reason is simply that the point is moving in the feature space towards other classes which are closer to the class zero, up to reaching class one when the perturbation is sufficient to this extent. Okay, so the demo, uh, you can play with that at this address, which is sec minus ml dot pluribus minus one dot lab. And hopefully, if you don't try all together, it should not, it should not break. <laughs> so the web app should, should stay working. Okay, any question on this part? Yeah, please. So let, let me see if I understand the, cor the, the question correctly. You mean if you apply the same perturbation to different samples? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so the question is if it's possible that it exists and an adversarial example exists for each input point. The question is pretty much yes, if the constraint is, you know, if the problem is constrained in such a way that you can find it. So if, if the perturbation, if the possible perturbation is uh, sufficient, then yes, you can, you can find a way to evade detection. That's, that's my experience, yeah. If the attacker is somehow constrained in a more complex way, for example, if you can only increase the feature values, like in the case of PDF malware, then you can conceive some secure learning algorithm that exploits this constraint and avoids that for any sample you can find an evasion point. So there are possibilities of countering this attack. Yeah, please, that's another question. That's a good question. So the question is if, if some of the classes are more sensible or sensitive to this problem of being vulnerable in some sense. The question is, I don't know of uh, any studies that prove this kind of empirically to some extent, but my guess is yes, they are sensible. It's pretty much like in biometrics, where you, if you know this notion of Doddington Zoo, there are some users which are prone to be le more vulnerable than others. People whose face, for example, is easier to mimic, or people that are better at imitating other people, these kind of things. So I guess it, it also exists for classes, for these kind of problems.
Yeah. So the question is if the line if in some sense this is a problem of linear classifiers, you can mitigate that with nonlinear classifiers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and how the ex the examples are can be transferred across models. Uh, I think yes. So, so linear classifiers have a problem, have an intrinsic problem, which is the fact that they bisect the space into two halves. So there is, if, if the input space is eigendimensional, like in the case of images, there are a lot of kind of blind spots that you can exploit, right? Whereas with nonlinear algorithms, you can mitigate the problem with this idea of enclosing the classes, basically. Uh, however, for linear classifiers, uh, we, don't have, we didn't have time to cover this in the tutorial, but there's a nice paper that, that connects um, the regularization term you use with the kind of noise you have on data. And then they show, for example, that if you have Euclidean uh, worst case noise on data, then the best thing is to use L2 regularization. If you use a sparse attack, for example, L1, like in the case of PDF, so if the attacker modifies just few features to a large extent, then the better and the best regularizer is to use the max norm. So it's to set a bound on the, on the feature weights. That's, that's the idea. But we exploited this on, on, on some work. So if, if any of you is interested, we can discuss more on this uh, offline, I would say. Okay, thanks. I'll take the last question. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I know that paper, yeah. So you're talking about universal perturbation. That means uh, in some cases, you can apply the same noise to different images to have them misclassified. That, that was the main message, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's time for the last question. Right? Yeah, so generally, I mean, this is one of the defenses that they use, right? To some extent, it, it improves the uh, classification accuracy. I, I mean, it detects some kind of adversarial examples. But the problem is that since you don't have any guarantee in formal terms, like in, in, in Nash games or you know, from game theory, you don't have any guarantee that it will design this kind of closed set, fun so the closed function around the benign data or the legitimate classes. Plus, it's very computationally intensive because it, the idea is to generate samples and you have to cover, in some sense, the whole feature space with adversarial examples. And as you know, this is exponential. Uh, it's an exponential problem for, 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 for learning. Okay. So it may work, but we don't have any formal guarantees that it does. Plus, it's difficult to achieve um, this kind of behavior that we need for, for secure learning. Okay. So now, uh, in the next 20 minutes, 30 minutes, I'm, I'm going to talk about poisoning attacks against machine learning, where the goal of the attack here is different and how the attack is staged is, is completely different. So the idea is that you have a learning system which is trained on, on some data and it has some good generalization properties on test data which is drawn from the same distribution, which means it's very similar to the training data plus or minus some stochastic noise, right? And this is depicted in the last two um, sketches in the, in the slide, okay? The goal of the poisoning, and sorry, here, again, you have a collection of spam and M emails, and you use them to learn your feature weights, right? So if everything runs out smoothly, you end up in having positive weights that well characterize bad words, and negative weights that well characterize uh, good words, words used in legitimate emails. Okay, this is the standard setting. Now, as an attacker, you may want to, you may be able to inject data into the training phase, into the training set. And then, you may want to do that with the goal of screwing up the classifier completely at test time. How can you do that? So for example, in the case of spam, you can craft some spam emails that contain good words. So for example, you can take this, the spam email we've seen before and add the words university and campus. And you may 
use a color in your email, you can paint them white such that who gets the spam doesn't even realize that there's additional text in the email. And then what happens is that the user just flags this email as spam. Okay? But if you do this repeatedly, then it will happen that your classifier in the end will learn also the good words as bad words. So in this case, university and campus may be assigned a positive weight, which in turn amounts to misclassifying a lot of legitimate emails. A lot of your legitimate emails, especially if you use university and campus in your, in your, in your legitimate uh, correspondence. And the effect is effectively that for a linear classifier, changing the weights mean, means tilting the decision boundaries, and, and this is depicted basically uh, in, the, in the top plots. Okay, so this is the idea of poisoning attacks. The attacker wants to craft some training instances and craft them to be in a minimum number, so the, a very small set of poisoning instances that will maximize the classification error of the classifier. And so again, here, this can be casted in terms of the model we've been describing today. You can say the goal is to maximize the classification error, that is to cause a denial of service to legitimate users. And the knowledge again can be perfect or limited using the same trick uh, we've been discussing before. So using either the true classifier, the targeted classifier, if, it, if, it's, if it's known, or using a surrogate model that approximates the true classifier. And the capability We want to find the worst possible point for the classifier. So the point XC that when it is learned by the classifier, it will maximize the error. For example, assume that you have this linear classifier, which is a linear SVM, trained on this simple data, and the classification error is here measured on a separate test set is roughly 2%. Now what happens if I add a red point at the right bottom corner of the data, XC, and when the classifier learns this point, you see that to reduce the loss of this point, basically the boundary is, is tilted a bit towards that point. And this is done to reduce the, the loss on the training data, right? But what happens is that the loss on the test data will increase in this case. And in particular, it will raise up to almost 4%. Okay? So this is what we want to do. Plus, we want to find the best point for the attacker, which means the one that maximizes that error. So if you shift XC into, the, into this bidimensional feature space, and you measure the test error when this point is learned by the classifier, you can display this nice objective function, which shows you how the classification error varies with respect to XC. And uh, as you can see, so this is a linear SVM. So when you add the red point XC on the left side of the boundary, basically nothing changes because this point is learned by the SVM, but is not even entering the set of support vectors. So the classifier remains exactly the same and so does the classification error. Whereas if you put the point on the other side, well, some effect occurs, and in particular, the error is maximized, in this case, in the uh, right bottom corner of, of this plot, okay? And in fact, it can reach up to 6% if you add it exactly to the corner. Okay, is this clear to everybody? That's, that's the goal. Now, this is just to give the intuition behind how, how to craft the attack, but then we have to formalize this. And as we will see in a minute, poisoning amounts to um, solving a bilevel, a so-called bilevel optimization problem. So here, why it's a bilevel problem? It's a bilevel problem because the attacker wants to maximize a loss function on your test data, or better, on a, on a, can, on a set of data that somehow reflects the test data. So he has a validation set, which does not contain any attack, and you want to maximize the error on that. 
but you want to do that with respect to XC, with respect to a training point, and here there is an implicit dependency um, between these variables in the sense that the classifier F star here depends exactly on XC, on the training set, right? And on the attack point as well. And so this problem is constrained actually by another, uh, by another optimization problem which amounts to the learning problem. So basically this is why this is a bi-level problem because you have two nested optimization problems. One is the objective of the, of the attacker which is to maximize the loss in the validation set and the other one is the minimization problem of the classifier to optimize loss on the training set. Okay? And uh, um, clearly there are different techniques that you can use to solve this problem. This is how it maps to the SVM case, for example, just an instance, uh, where you can see that the only dependency that you have uh, on XC is in the bottom problem, is in the inner problem, okay? These are well-known problems in the context of games. This amounts to a Stackelberg game, if you're interested in, but these are just details. What is interesting to know is that you can solve this again with a gradient, uh, computing the gradient of the problem. It's a bit more complex in this case because the training point, um, as you shift the training point into the feature space, the classifier also changes. And then your gradient, in some sense, has to account for that. And, but to this end, you can exploit a trick, which is basically to, modif to replace the inner problem, which is the learning algorithm, with its equilibrium conditions. So we know that, for example, SVMs or logistic regression, other simple classifiers optimize a function, and the optimum is, find, is found when uh, you know, the gra either the gradient vanishes with respect to the classifier parameters, or you, you eat some, co or, or you eat the constraint in some sense. So basically, you can replace the learning algorithm with its equilibrium conditions, which are the Karsch-Kuntaker conditions, and. Once you do that, if it is, is possible, then you can compute the gradient in closed form. So I, I point you to the paper we did with uh, um, Blaine Nansol and, and Pavel Laskov at ICML in 2012 for details. Uh, but this is just uh, how the gradient looks like for the SVM. Uh, it, it works for linear and nonlinear cases. And as you can see, the gradient is fairly more complex than the evasion case which is probably also the reason why people have not been considering this attack against deep nets uh, again <laughs> to, 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 to the moment. And we have a similar derivation for other uh, op optimization based classifiers like uh, ridge, lasso, and logistic regression. There are similar ways you can compute the gradient and this is uh, how running the algorithm looks like. In the linear case, so you start from, from a point xc0 and then you iteratively modify the point up to, uh, following the gradient uh, direction, up to the, uh, the local maxima, up to a local maxima, and then this attack can also be staged against nonlinear classifiers, as in the RBF case you see below. And uh, this is, again, a, an example with digits, as people love so much this data set, we also use that, we, we always use that. Um, and here the task is to distinguish between four and zero. So it's a, for simplicity, it's a binary case again. And so the, the first attack is a four. We just flip the label. So when you, if you just flip the label of that four, of, of the left hand side uh, four in the training set, you have a tiny increase in the error, which is iteration zero here. So you start from basically a zero error to something which is, I would say, less than 1%, okay? Then you start optimizing the point, optimizing the attack with the gradient ascent, and what happens is that you have this strange blurring effect, and now if you add this manipulated uh, four labeled as zero in the training set, what happens is that with just a single point, the testing error increases up to 20%, okay? So, of course, here we have to consider that we have a lot of features because we have 784 features as we have 28 by 28 pixel images here and we're just using a small training set. So the data in some sense is sparse in, in the feature space. But yet, one single attack point can create 
can cause a big error at test time, up to 20% in this case. You can run multiple attack points, you can use multiple attack points, that is optimize one attack, send it, and then optimize the others. And in this case, using less than 10% of training data, you can completely screw up the SVM, uh, reaching an error which is close to 40%. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, I hope it's, it's clear enough. And uh, of course, there, has, there have been some attempts to poison deep nets as well. And one very interesting paper is this best uh, paper at ICML 2000, uh, this year, basically 2017, by Co and others, whose goal is, was a bit different, but they showed as a side effect that you can uh, construct some poisoning data to compromise some predictions made by the deep network. Now, they did that by just keeping the whole network fixed and frozen, like in the ICAB case. You use the whole network as a feature extractor, basically, and then they used, they just modified the last layer. So they used the same technical um, algorithm we developed for the other case. They used logistic regression, which is, again, for which you can exploit the KKT conditions, and then you can compute the gradient. And then they just backpropagate the gradient through the network, as we did for ICAP. And what they showed is that, for example, if you have this image of this dog uh, uh, up left, and you label it as a fish, well, nothing changes to that much. But then if you add this kind of noise uh, crafted with this gradient descent algorithm, then you can uh, subvert the prediction of those dog images that you see below. So that dogs were correctly classified as dogs before the attack and after the attack. So after you inject that single point labeled as fish and with this adversarial noise into the training data, well, the confidence prediction by the, deep, by the network, by the classifier completely changes in favor of fish. So all these five dogs are classified as fish eventually. Okay. That was shown by using uh, the same algorithm, basically the same algorithm we developed for SVMs and other classifiers, using KKT-based conditions. So the question we've been addressing was then, hey, what if we consider a whole network? Because when you modify the training data, it's not true that only the, less, the last layer will change. The whole set of deeper layers will, will also change, right? And, and then the first attack, was ignoring this fact. And, and however, to consider this kind of end-to-end -end poisoning, you cannot exploit the KKT conditions for several reasons. First, networks are not trained to such a precision to meet the equilibrium conditions. You can have early stopping or other criteria. It's much more empirical in this case. And, and um, <coughs> It is also fairly complex to account for the KKT conditions for millions of parameters, right? So KKT-based poisoning is not feasible for deep networks. And then we thought about using automatic differentiation. For automatic differentiation, it is also complex in this case because you have to represent the whole optimization problem as, as a computational graph. So in this case, you want to infer how the loss function on the validation set changes when the input changes. And the input in this case is the attack point, the training point XC. So basically you have to construct a computational graph to automatically compute the derivative that you need by essentially storing the all uh, training procedure of the network. Because you need to represent the function in an end-to-end -end manner. So starting from the first iteration up to the last iteration n of the algorithm, and this requires replicating the, the network structure n times, where n is the given number of iterations that you use to train the deep net, which is clearly unfeasible. It's already uh, uh, complex to store a single deep network in, 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 uh, in memory on a computer. Imagine if you have to do this n times and the network is huge. This is not, not doable. It will be very slow, very inefficient, whatever. So the simple idea we exploited in this work 
that we published this year at the AISEC workshop was to trace the procedure, the learning procedure backwards. So in some cases, this gradient based training algorithms that you have can be traced back. So you can compute the updates in an inverse manner, starting from the final solution that you have and going back to the initial random state of the network. And by doing that, you can poisoning deep nets in a, very, in a much more efficient way, though it's still very computational intensive, okay? And we have some preliminary um, results on digits here. So on the left, you have poisoning digits computed against the logistic regression, so again, a linear, a linear classifier, and you can visually see that they are manipulated, whereas for the deep networks, the modifications that you have to make on digits are very difficult to spot. And um, the reason here is, again, that, uh, that, that in some sense, the network mapping from, from the input to the deep feature space is quite unstable. <clears throat> But uh, there's also another result is, uh, which, we, which we found is that this attack is not very effective against uh, deep network. So when you add these digits, we, we tested up to 1% of, of corrupted training data. We, don't, we didn't find any significant improvement in the test error. So you can just flip the decision on some samples, on some test samples, but overall it's not quite affecting the classifier, at least for very small poisoning percentage, but this is kind of ongoing work that we're exploring. And maybe this is due to the high capacity of these classifiers. So essentially when you add a poisoning point, the network just learned the poisoning point as it is without changing the decision on the other points, on other regions of, of the feature space. And there are of course some countermeasures that you, that you can use against these uh, classifiers, which you are not covering for, 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 the, for time reasons in the tutorial. But the idea is that um, for poisoning to be effective, you have to inject outlying samples into the training data. So you have to inject samples which are different from the rest of the data, otherwise you have no impact at all. And in fact, if you, if you look at these pictures, you, have, you are injecting red samples very far away from the red class. Okay, so this is the rationale behind why this attack works, essentially. And therefore, to counter that, you can exploit different techniques, essentially based on variations of outlier detection, or anomaly detection in some sense. You can use data sanitization, where the idea is basically to identify the outlying points, the outliers in the data, and remove them. And we can do that, so we did that with this uh, weighted bagging, so by paper is bag bagging for uh, fighting poisoning attacks, where the idea was exactly to reduce the influence of outlying points in the training data, just, just as the, uh, similar to the question we had for the evasion case. So we reduce the influence of strange anomalous point in the training data. Or you can also use this other defense, which is called reject on negative impact, where the idea is to split the training data into several faults and see, hoping that all the outliers will end up in one folder you will see the difference when you train classifiers on, on separate fold, fold of, of training data. And the other main idea was to learn something which is intrinsically robust to outliers, which you can do with robust statistics or similar frameworks. And there is a nice paper on this um, proposing uh, using robust PCA um, to be less sensitive to network traffic. Now I have to restart the mic twice to work. But uh, are there any questions? Yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah, if you, if you learn, yeah, in the same way you did the, yeah, you learn a surrogate and you, we did tests on that and it works. For, uh, yeah, we published that on ICML to 2015. There, there are examples of this. Uh, there was another question, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the question is that sometimes deep networks, um, when you feed the examples to them, they, they can learn them in, in a different way or, or not as expected. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So and this is probably one of the reasons behind poisoning not being so effective. Uh, but in general, we need more understanding on what's going on there. And so yeah, this is under investigation. So now I think I'm, I'm done for my part, and then I, I will leave the stage to Fabio for, for the last part of the talk. Thanks. Oh, sorry. There is a question. <laughs> Well, the point is that if the modifications are indistinguishable, these samples, so what, what happens here is that you have samples in the input space which are very close together, and, but since the mapping of the network is unstable, you end up having these points very far in the deep, spa in the deep space. That's why they're vulnerable. So this is rather a vulnerability of how you learn the mapping between these spaces. So of course you have to patch that. But then the other problem remains. So it's a combination of factors. One is to protect the classifier in the last stage, where you can use enclosed decision functions or uh, rejection, for example. And then, of course, you have to ensure that this smoothness as assumption remains valid while you learn the mapping function. That I hope it answers your question to, to some extent. OK, so thank you very much. Okay, well, uh, yeah, we, we, we can uh, move to, let's say, the, the last part uh, of the tutorial where, well, we, we, well, we, we want to discuss about uh, how much uh, larger is the practical feasibility of adversarial attacks, uh, focusing on, uh, in particular, adversarial examples and adversarial images. Uh, so, well, let, let me start with some uh, general concept, uh, and, and then I try to make clear the point that we want to discuss in this part of the tutorial. You, you see the title is, uh, what about adversarial examples? Uh, for example, adversarial images, as the images that we have discussed before, all the strange images that due to the instability of deep networks, for example, change the classification of deep network completely, even if the images uh, are not visually distinguishable for, for humans. They, they, they look the same for humans. But the point now is, uh, while uh, really these kind of adversarial examples, and in particular adversarial images, are a real issue, a real threat, in the wild, in the real world. Why this is a, an interesting question? Because while well, there are a few papers, there, there was a few papers in the last year that raised uh, a lot of concern, a lot of worries about uh, the vulnerability of, for instance, of, of deep network, but also of other classifiers, but the emphasis, of course, uh, is uh, on the network because people wrote article telling, well, we, we have a serious problem because supposing that this kind of technology, for instance, deep networks, uh, they are really implemented uh, on board of real device operating in real environments. The extreme case uh, is uh, self-driving vehicles. Uh, what about this vulnerability? Because uh, we have some uh, paper from the academia uh, well, reporting results that uh, deep networks are very vulnerable. Uh, what also images, as, as my colleague has, has shown, uh, slightly modified uh, can change completely the output, the classification. So, well, of course, this could be a serious problem uh, for uh, 
as the so-called admission critical applications. And then, well, in, over the past year, many articles, many papers have raised these kind of issues. For instance, well, it's quite obvious, uh, putting emphasis on the case of autonomous vehicles, uh, and what happens if I have uh, a deep network visual system recognizing road signs, given that uh, it looks that uh, slightly modification of the images of road signs could change completely the classification. Yeah, but because of course, well, there are papers like the paper that I'm mentioning on this slide that reported a result that yes, if I use a databases of road sign images, well, I, I, I can I can uh, have results about adversarial images of road signs, and so well, in principle, someone can claim that we have a serious problem, this technology based on deep networks cannot be used for mission critical application. So well, now the problem and the question that is interesting to discuss during the last part of the tutorial, but it's a real threat. Do, do we think that uh, this kind of uh, let's say, instability, vulnerability, uh, and uh, uh, that uh, we, we, we can see and that's been reported, uh, for instance, for deep network. I'm focusing on deep network because well, this is the mainstream of machine learning now, and so it, it's a lot of emphasis and interest on that. Uh, is it a real threat or not? Yeah, because, uh, well, if you read this recent paper on IEEE security and privacy, the authors, they claim we have a serious problem. Yeah, they, this, this technology cannot be used for a security application. But it's really true. It's a well-posed argument on we should be more careful with these kind of claims. And uh, well, what I want to do is to discuss with you th this point because I think it's important uh, so that uh, we avoid to raise concerns that probably are only partially motivated. And to understand that, uh, we should consider that uh, all the results that has been reported, all, sorry, most of the results that has been reported uh, about uh, the vulnerability, the instability, of deep networks, and so how much they are sensitive to that kind of adversarial images, slightly perturbated, has been uh, uh, done using uh, the digital data. I mean, assuming that uh, I can manipulate that image of the road sign directly, changing the pixel, without considering that in the real world you have to collect the images using sensors, using camera. So the first important uh, things to note uh, is that uh, in the papers that has been published, uh, we have assumed, and the authors assumed that uh, you can manipulate directly the digital data and so producing what has been called Okay, double restart is okay. <laughs> and uh, yeah, but it's, this is not the case, of course, because in the most, uh, well, uh, well, there are many, it, it's okay when you consider tasks like spam filtering or PDF malware detection, because in that case, yes, the adversary has a direct access to the digital data so it can manipulate directly. But if you consider, well, this kind of task, so that you, are Im you imagine that, yes, you have uh, a self-driving, uh, well, a mechanism for automated assistant, automatic assistant to, to, the, to the driver on board of a real vehicle, of course, you have a camera collecting the pictures, the, the images of road signs, and so, well, what means that uh, to judge if, uh, if uh, adversarial images are a real threat, a real problem or not, uh, you should re uh, really try if supposing that someone is as uh, an adversary changes slightly 
the road sign, the physical road sign and the physical word, uh, what happens when this, the, 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 this road sign, the, the picture is collected? Is still an adversarial example, an adversarial image able to evade a deep network? So the, the first point is, uh, yeah, that we should consider that the world is not digital and so we should be uh, more careful to judge if uh, in the real world uh, adversarial examples are really a problem or not. Consider the, the other example that uh, we are and the experiment that uh, we did in our laboratory. Yeah? It's true that uh, if you apply if you, pr if you use the algorithm, the optimization algorithm that my colleague has described, uh, you can, uh, well, identify a possible stickers and identify which color, colors the sticker should have uh, so that uh, the bottle with the sticker, with that sticker, could evade, could fool the, the vision system of the robot but we, we need uh, more and more experiments to judge uh, if, uh, yeah, th this is a, a real practical attack against uh, a, a robot with a vision system that could collect uh, images from different distances, from different angles. Mm? So it's something that uh, needs more investigation yeah, to judge how much adversarial images and adversarial examples are a real threat in the real world, in the physical world. And the other important point to discuss around this issue is that uh, while over the last year, especially in the context with respect to deep network, there was a large emphasis about uh, uh, Adver the so-called adversarial images, which are visually indistinguishable for humans, which are exactly the same. So while well, it's very impressive, it was very impressive, the, the, the paper that at the beginning in 2014 has shown that yes, the school bus image inside the ImageNet database could be slightly modified and uh, is recognized as an ostrich, an, anim an animal, by a deep net, many different uh, deep network. Okay, but uh, uh, well, this is another, and this is partially what uh, my colleague called the misconception. What is it partially a misconception? That in, in the real world, well, it's not so important uh, that uh, the adversarial image is visually indistinguishable, yeah? And, and I, I will show you uh, in a few slides some examples, yeah? Be because uh, well, an attack against a real system working in the real physical world can be anyway very effective, even if, uh, well, there are modifications that are visually, can be visually perceived by, by human beings. But along this line, in the last, uh, the, 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 is raising a discussion in the community, because uh, especially last year, was some uh, oh, people started to, to, to raise the question and to investigate how much adversarial example, adversarial images, can be a real threat in the physical world. And the first paper, well, that uh, raised this problem was the paper that I'm referring in, in the slide, uh, published at, at the Machine Learning Conference, that started to investigate if uh, adversarial images can, be, uh, can, can really evade deep networks and other classifiers when the images are collected by a real sensor, a real camera. So taking into account uh, the possible distortion or the matter of fact uh, that the acquisition uh, is uh, at a distance and there are different angles and so on. And in this paper, this issue has been explored with a positive answer. Mm? The first experiment, uh, well, seems to suggest uh, that uh, yes, Adversarial images are still effective even if uh, well, they are not a manipulation 
uh, in the digital world, but there is a sensor acquiring the image. But there are other arguments against, and I, I will tell you something about. Well, another positive answer about the effectiveness of adversarial images in the physical world, and so yes, they are a real threat, uh, is this paper that I mentioned at, at the beginning. Well, now we are able to say that uh, in this paper that I mentioned at the beginning, the authors to fabricate mm, the, the high glasses that I, I have shown you at, at the beginning, they use it exactly. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's a little bit difficult probably to understand all the detail, uh, but, but uh, well, what uh, the authors of this paper did to uh, identify how the high glasses should be fabricated yeah, to evade the deep face recognition system, and they use it exactly well, the algorithm based on gradient optimization that we explained in this tutorial. And this is another evidence. And then, uh, while well, they did experiment uh, really collecting pictures of people using a camera, using different camera. So this looks an, another evidence that yes, this kind of cases of adversarial images are a real threat. With the term real threat, I mean something that can really happen in the physical world when images are collected with a sensor. Yeah? And so, well, the question behind is uh, so, it's a real threat? Should be worried that, uh, well, should be worried in the sense that, uh, well, probably is not too safe to use uh, deep networks for security application where there is a, a potential adversary behind because this network uh, well looks very uh, unstable and so while it's not so difficult uh, changing something, ch uh, making some changes to the data that you can do in the physical world, uh, well, the output of the network and so the recognition output is completely the same. So well, a question that uh, people are starting to debate is uh, well, it's a real threat. Well, just now I reported two, two papers uh, with, that gave a positive answer. Yes, this kind of threats looks real, can happen. But also recently, this year and last year, it's been reported uh, uh, negative arguments. For instance, I want to mention you an interesting paper that was exactly the opposite view where the authors, they did a lot of experiments just to show that, uh, well, in the real world, uh, when, uh, for instance, on board of a car, of a vehicles, the images of road signs, for example, are taken at different distances with different angles. Well, in this case, uh, just for a minority of cases, adversarial images of road sign manipulated are effective. Yeah? Because are effective for some distances, but not for other distances uh, for different angles. And this paper is quite interesting because uh, the authors, they did uh, a serious and quite extensive experimental work. Means that uh, they really fabricated uh, road sign manipulated and, and they put this road sign uh, along different roads and they use it in vehicles equipped with a camera to collect uh, real images while the vehicle was going and the experiment uh, showed that uh, well only for the minority of cases these adversarial road signs are effective in the sense that they are able to fool uh, the deep network uh, recognition system on board of, of the vehicles. But on the other hand, uh, there are other papers 
telling no. Well, we have evidences that, uh, yeah, if we change the perspective and we don't focus on adversarial images, uh, slightly manipulated, but uh, we look, we take a different perspective, and we allow to manipulate uh, the images, for instance, of road signs in a different way, uh, these images are still uh, effective, and so they can evade uh, uh, machine learning algorithms like deep networks uh, uh, in the real world. Look at the, th these examples are taken from the paper that uh, is mentioned on the slide, and you look again the experiments that the authors did and they reported in this paper are about uh, how much uh, the image of uh, a few road signs collected by a real sensor can fool uh, a deep network recognizer. But uh, look carefully at the road sign. You see, they used the gradient-based optimization algorithm for creating adversarial images which are not uh, visually indistinguishable. But uh, they used uh, the algorithm to, they forced the algorithm to devise, uh, well, to find which are the manipulation that uh, could appear as stickers, hmm? as light uh, uh, manipulation on the road sign, and it's enough to evade uh, the deep network recognizer. Do you get the point? Uh, is a different kind. The, the goal in this paper is not to find uh, adversarial images which are visually indistinguishable. Because the assumption is that, uh, well, suppose that there is uh, this road sign uh, along the road. Well, yeah, uh, something that it can happen is not necessary that the road sign is visually indistinguishable. Yeah? And considering this perspective, in this paper, the authors has shown that, uh, yes, well, even if you well, if you, uh, when you do the experiments in vivo, in the wild, using sensor, collecting the images, and so at different distances, from different angles, this kind of adversarial road signs are still uh, a real threat. A real threat because for a large uh, percentage of cases, they are able to fool deep network uh, recognition systems. And uh, the last, and, and so this is uh, an argument in favor of uh, the threat, the real threat. Yes, this could be a real threat. Yeah, well, the same result uh, along the same uh, line has been reported recently by these two people working in open AI that, uh, again, they did some experiment uh, to check uh, if uh, Suppose that I use an algorithm based on gradient optimization to, to create adversarial images. How are these adversarial images able to fool a deep network when the images are acquired by a real sensor? And they, well, that, you, you can find, well, if, if, you, if, you, if you read the paper, there are many video as, as companion material, as addition, oh, sorry. Well, yeah, you can see videos like this where you see this is a, an image of a cat well collected by a smartphone and uh, there is a, a deep network recognizing uh, this image uh, during uh, the acquisition process and uh, is always wrongly recognized as a desktop. Of course, the image of the cat has been uh, created using the evasion attack that we have explained in, uh, in the tutorial. And so this paper is another, let's, uh, evidence in favor of the fact that yes, adversarial examples, adversarial images can be a real threat in the, in the physical world when you have a sensor, a camera collecting the images. But as I told before, there are also 
negative evidence. And so it's really an open issue to me well, to assess well using a large scale experimentation how much this is a, a real threat in the physical world. Because anyway, we are still speaking in these cases of small, uh, small cases, small size experiments. And so it's needed to me well, more extensive and large scale experiment to assess the, the real threat uh, of this. Uh, well, if you have any comment or, or uh, about this, of course, well, please interrupt me and, or any question, okay? The point, uh, I hope that it's clear enough, the point is uh, there was a large emphasis over the last two, three years about adversarial images, adversarial examples, and at the beginning, all the paper dealt with uh, manipulation of the images in the digital format, assuming that the adversary has direct access to the digital data. This is true for some applications, spam filtering, PDF malware detection, but it's not true if you imagine some, an application where the data should be collected by a sensor. So now there is a, an open issue. While in the real world where the images, the data, the patterns are collected by sensor, how much this kind of threat of adversarial images are a real threat or not? Because there are many conditions, the distance of the acquisition, the angle, and so on that should be considered. And as you have seen from this paper, there are people saying, no, it's not a serious problem. Yes, it's a serious problem. It can happen in the real, in the real world when you collect pictures from a sensor. Okay, uh, having said that, let me go smoothly to, to the conclusion. First thing, well, adversarial learning, adversarial pattern recognition, um, well, is a recent field, recent research field. Uh, recent uh, means that, uh, well, the first paper, the first paper clearly linked to this uh, field, uh, research field, uh, has been published uh, well in 2004, so well, more than 10 years ago. If you look from a, an historical perspective, even if the, 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 the time span is very short, but if you try to look uh, from a short historical perspective to this field about uh, the security hmm, of uh, learning, uh, well, an interesting thing to me is that, uh, well, this research subfield started in 2004, and after some years, after 10 years, well, it started uh, something that uh, at the beginning was a, a parallel research field, much more focused on the security of deep neural network. Hmm? And now, well, while the two fields are going on, of course, there are many intersect, many link, many many link between the two fields. But it's something that is important to know that uh, well, they in some sense started uh, as a two different fields. Why? If you remember, and uh, well, the first paper that has been published. started the interest, well, the interest about uh, the instability, the security of deep neural network. That was a paper not clearly related to adversarial learning. But from that paper, people working in deep network, in deep learning, they started to become more and more interested about the security aspect, the adversarial aspect uh, of deep learning. So now there is a clear relationship between these two research Sorry, okay, that at the beginnings, they were to, to separate a uh, research line. Well, looking from these research issues from an historical perspective, what is interesting to, t to, to say, going to the conclusion, is that, uh, well, what we can call at the beginning as a, a sort of black swan, is in, the animal is not a swan, but it's an ostrich, 
Well, at the beginning, uh, they, they attracted really a lot, a lot of interest. And this is something that we should take into account, hmm? because there is a lot of interest for this kind uh, of research, I mean, the security of deep neural network that uh, went uh, behind uh, while the scientific journals, well, there, there is a nice article that has been published on Nature that uh, is a good example of uh, the big interest that many stakeholders, not only computer scientists, they have uh, for the safety of machine learning and the safety in particular of deep net neural network. And, and there are, well, if you if you don't know this, this paper published on Nature, well, I want my personal, I recommend you to, to, to read it because it's quite interesting. It's quite interesting to check how people who are outside, while well, the, the field of machine learning and computer vision, they consider uh, the problem, the issue of safety of, of, of machine learning. Well, for us who are computer scientists, of course, interesting why there is so much interest, hmm? well, also outside our communities. And uh, to me, the, the, the answer is, is very simple. Well, uh, I, I don't know if you, if you agree with me or not, but because, uh, well, 10 years ago or more, well, the success of machine learning and computer vision for practical application was quite limited. And so, well, people, we are not so well surprised about when machine learning systems were wrong. Uh, they were much more surprised when something was uh, working well. But now that, uh, well, there are some evidences, uh, right or wrong, uh, that this technology could work for real applications, sometimes large-scale application. Of course, there is a natural uh, interest about uh, how much this technology is safe. Yeah, especially if you want to, to use them for mission critical application. Mm? But, well, to conclude, I, I, I want to share with you my, my view about this, mm? about uh, if these uh, worries are uh, justified, are motivated or not. And uh, well, so I want to share you my opinion, telling you that. First thing, uh, well, wh when you speak about uh, the vulnerability of deep neural networks, so how much they are unstable and so that you can evade uh, and change completely the output of neural network just using images with a very slight modification. First thing, uh, you should consider that uh, it, it's not true, uh, sorry. <laughs> Well, I come not into the internet, and so, yeah. Uh, we should consider that uh, is not uh, only uh, a phenomenon uh, that is true for uh, uh, neural networks. It's very common for all the other classifiers. So it's not right uh, to give too much emphasis to the problem of the vulnerability of deep neural networks, like, uh, that this was a, a very strange phenomenon. It's only another, another manifestation well, of uh, some basic issues that uh, are well known also for other classifiers, yeah? and uh, are known since uh, 2004 and probably uh, before. So well, it's important in this field really to connect the dots and to look at the first fundamental results. And the other message that I want to share with you is that uh, yes, uh, machine learning technology, and in particular neural network, uh, they seem uh, to make uh, well strange errors, sometimes stupid error, and the big emphasis over the past years was when a deep network uh, misclassifies uh, images that for us human beings are, well, the same, basically. But uh, we should consider that, uh, yes, machine learning algorithm has a lot uh, of source of biases depending on the training set that you use, depending on the parameters, and in the case of deep neural networks, it's quite clear that uh, there is uh, an instability, a propagation of instability layer after year layer, and uh, this is a, 
uh, an open issue is not yet, uh, not yet solved. That. But on the other way, if you want to, well, to consider a, a, a broad perspective, we should consider that this is also true for human beings. Hmm? We have many sorts of biases. And so I, I want to conclude to mention this, for instance. I don't know if you already know this small, this small quiz, hmm? this small problem. It's very famous. Ra raise your hands if you already know this. You know? OK, you know. So you, you, are not, you, cannot, you can't reply to the question. But if you read this, uh, this uh, well, small problem, you see the bat and the ball problem, quite famous. A bat and the ball together cost uh, $1.10. The bat cost $1 more than the bell. How much does the bell cost? What is the answer? First answer to your, yeah? What is the answer? Okay. Let's see that, uh, well, this question has been, uh, well, to many people, and the most of people, also people who have, uh, well, a clear scientific education, the first answer that they say is 10 cent. Yeah, the answer is 10 cent. Why? Because in many cases, people, the decision are very biased, and this is a very well-known cognitive bias, yeah, that is called as attribute substitution. Okay, that, uh, well, the most of people, well, this experiment uh, has been done uh, in many classes of uh, undergrad students in different universities, and the most of students, the first answer is 10 cent, yeah? Because it's, it's a cognitive bias very well known. And so, to make short and long story, this means that uh, when we are uh, surprised about the biases of machine learning algorithms, we should remember that also human beings, for some task, they, are, they have a lot of biases like this one. And so they, when they are obliged to, to reply fast, the, well, the answers in many cases are wrong. And this is very, very well known in a completely different field that, that is, is called a, a financial, well, behavioral finance, behavioral economics, where people, they know that unfortunately people, when they have to make decision well, for economic or financial problems, they have a lot of bias. So the real problem to me is, uh, well, to understand that, yes, deep neural networks sometimes they do, they, they are very, Okay, but uh, the, the real issue to me is uh, how to understand when we should be more confident with algorithmic decision and when we should be more confident with decision by, by human beings. So to conclude, well, my, my view, my personal view is that uh, as far as, well, it's for sure, while machine learning will be used more and more in practical application, uh, and so the introduction of new learning functionality for sure will increase uh, the vulnerability and the access surface of, of our computer system uh, over the time. And so uh, my personal view is that, that this issue, these issues of uh, adversarial learning, adversarial pattern recognition will become more and more important. Okay, that's, that's all. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. And any question here or offline is welcome. If you have any questions or comments here, well, we, we have time. Oh, yes, please. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, I get the point. Okay, let, let me first rephrase your, your question for, for, for the audience. Well, it's, it's a very precise question because uh, the gentleman is referring uh, 
to a different issue. Maybe you know the paper. There is a famous paper by uh, a researcher that is Antonio Torralba. It's about uh, how much the data sets that we use in computer vision are biased. That means that when you use a data set for recognizing objects, for instance, well, the algorithm, the object recognition algorithm that uh, you design using a given data set works very well for that data set, but when you change data set, nothing, nothing works. Okay, uh, and so, the, uh, and this is a, uh, well, a famous uh, phenomenon that has been popularized by Antonio Soralba telling, well, uh, be careful with benchmark data sets because they are not so useful in, in the real world. <laughs> and also the question is, but uh, you mentioned biases, so you believe that in adversarial learning the main problem is the data sets. Well, yes and no, because uh, yes, in some cases, yes, because uh, if you use a bias, bias of the data set, uh, this can create uh, vulnerability problems, but uh, you should consider that in adversarial learning you have an additional problem because the adversary, well, yeah, if, if you use a biased data set, uh, you simplify the life of the adversary. That, that's, that's, but it's not the only problem, it's not the only problem, okay. Yes, please. Okay, yeah, it's, it's a good point. Uh, 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 it's, it's a different question. L l tell me if I, if I get exactly the question, your question. The question is, okay, adversarial examples are a problem for security issue, but uh, we have uh, any evidence that uh, d d they can also exploit it uh, to improve the accuracy of the system. So they are not only a problem, but uh, they can have a positive, a, a positive effect. Is this the question? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The answer is yes, because uh, many papers that uh, use it and exploited the concept that my colleague mentioned, that is called adversarial retraining. That is very simple. When I see that uh, some adversarial example images are able to evade my classifier, the first thing that I can do is to retrain the classifier using those examples. And this is good to make my pattern classifier more secure against the adversarial example, but some papers also reported the result that even if I, there is no adversary, is anyway good to use a given amount of adversarial example to make uh, my, my pattern classifier more effective on uh, unknown test data, and so to increase the generalization capability. Well, there is no theoretical guarantees as far as I know, okay? Uh, are only experimental evidences. Well, this is what I, what I know. I don't know if you know some papers with theoretical guarantees about this. Please. Yeah, sure. Which is proof to adversarial attacks? Sorry, I, 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 I don't. Well, okay. They are universal, universally robust. Well, I don't know. Do you have any, any answer as far as I know? No, there is. I, I don't believe that in practice because, well, I'm a security guy, so I don't trust that you can defend against everything. Yeah, so I don't believe that there is a universal defense. But to be honest, I don't have any clear and, any clear and well supported answer to your question. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. If I have understood well the point. But the point is uh, if I can. Well, along this line, if I can add something, is that, uh, you know, we can consider, well, the, the parallel tutorial uh, again. 
yeah, generate the adversarial network that uh, in some sense they exploit uh, the concept of uh, a two games, a, a, a two player game, yeah? an opponent and, and a defender and uh, within the framework of GAN, generative adversarial network, you have some proofs, also some theoretical guarantees, but not so strong, uh, that uh, using, uh, oh, well, y y you can try to improve the generalization capability because uh, you sample all better and better the data distribution. But I don't, I'm not so sure, I, I never thought uh, if this could be exploited uh, to create a, a universal defense mechanism. I don't know. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay, good point. Oh, let, let, let me try to, to reply in some, some extent. Well, there are two arguments in, 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 your, in what you have told, uh, if I got well. One is uh, vulnerability of deep neural networks and data classifier is a matter of, of instability. I mean, you have a small perturbation in the input space, and this becomes a large change in the output. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is for sure the reason, and uh, well, there are a few papers, uh, in particular there are papers written by, yes, yeah, it's a more mathematician than a computer scientist, Stephen Malat. Malat, yeah? And uh, the paper is entitled, The Mysteries, of deep neural networks. And in, a part of, in this paper, the authors say that yes, uh, try to explain why, using spectral theory, why layer by layer inside a deep network there is a, an amplification hmm, of the difference between the slight perturbation in the input space and the large change in the output space. So probably spectral theory could provide an answer to this. First. Second, what you, you, you have told about the redundancy. Yeah? Well, many years ago, I worked a lot on ensemble learning. Mm? So the first thing that came to my mind, yes, let's use a set of machine learning algorithms instead of one to make the system more robust. And indeed, with, with my students, we did a lot of work. And yes, we published some paper that show that, yes, using an ensemble of algorithms, in some sense, uh, you can improve the robustness, mm, but uh, there are no clear answers that this is true. Uh, it's, it's the, and uh, in some cases, you improve the robustness under the attack, but you lose accuracy for normal patterns, for normal inputs. And on the top of that, uh, recent papers trying to use and an ensemble of learning algorithms to make uh, deep neural networks more robust hmm, while they reported negative results. Well, uh, all in all, I continue to, to, to believe uh, that uh, redundancy mechanism and uh, machine learning means using an ensemble of algorithms can be useful. And uh, while many practical commercial product in security, they really use this concept. Hmm? Redundancy and using a, lo a lot of different versions of the same tool. So, well, I think that it's, 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 a, good, uh, it's a good direction. I don't know if I, I got exactly your, your point in your question. Okay, thank you. Any other comment or question? Anyway, oh, please.
Oh yeah, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a good point. Uh, and the intuition, I think, uh, is right. The intuition is, uh, well, everybody understands that uh, there are two faces of the problem. One is to detect adversarial example, and the other is to have a system that is robust. If I can detect in advance that, uh, uh, well, this input is an adversarial example, what I can do, I can reject. Hmm? Well, and I believe it, this is what we have done in, in the paper that we mentioned about robot vision, ICAB, to protect the system, to reject. Detection and rejection. This is a strategy. And I do believe that it's a good strategy for a practical problem. Suppose that rejecting the inputs is feasible. Okay? That's the point. There are, well, it's okay if the practical problem allows you to reject the decisions. But if you cannot do that, of course, that, that isn't a good, isn't good. You, if you, anyway, you have to process the inputs you, and you cannot use rejection. True, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, the point is again good. Anyway, even if you cannot reject, uh, if you are able to detect uh, your classifier, well, you could use a more sophisticated mechanism to process the, the data. It's true. Only one point, there is a, a recent paper this year about uh, the security of deep neural networks, and the authors investigated 10 different detection methods for adversarial images. <laughs> Unfortunately, the, well, the result, uh, well, for, of course, it's, it's, a, it's not, it, it's only, it's experimental evidences. The results are negative that, well, the detection method, they don't work so well, yeah? But anyway, this does, this means nothing about, uh, in, in general, I agree with you. At the conceptual level, detection is, 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 a, is, a, is a part of the job, important. Okay. Anyway, we, we will put the slides on the web on the web page where there is the announcement of the of the tutorial, and uh, well, also the link to the demo, the demo that my colleague has shown. And if you have any question, uh, well, send us an email. Okay. Now, on, anyway, we are at the conference for the next days. Thank you very much again.